Good day, scholars. This is the biggest video I've ever made in terms of size, quality, and in time, popularity. We're going to be here a while. Grab your coffee, popcorn, slippers, pipe. This one has massively been requested by yourselves over the last year during my What The Hell Happened series, and I finally found the strength and time to take on this mountain of a topic to give you the absolute truth about Dragon Ball Super. This is the stone cold truth about Super that needs to be brought to the Dragon Ball community table for everyone to finally realize just what we actually have on our plate. This is not hours of ripping into Dragon Ball Super, this is hours of explaining why Dragon Ball Super isn't the golden egg success at Dragon Ball Z that some people think it is, or hoped it would be. I'm one of the ones who hoped it would be. You will find out today that it's not Dragon Ball Super's fault, it's the writer's fault. And that's what you need to understand, there's a difference there and my intention is quite clear. That the makers truly ruined a product for us all, that we deserved for being loyal passionate Dragon Ball fans. Yes, I speak to all of us as one. All of us Dragon Ball fans, not super fans, not GT fans, not dub fans, none of that matters. We are all Dragon Ball fans together and we as a whole got screwed by what they gave us with Dragon Ball Super and yes, even Dragon Ball GT back in the day. Like I said, don't worry, that's coming next. It's the exact same feeling, none lived up to the original Dragon Ball and Z, that we as fans deserved for our patience and loyalty over the years to keep the spirit of Dragon Ball alive through the quiet age. We've never truly had an absolute success at the Z, a successor from start to finish being a solid product. So I'm going into this explanation video as an overall Dragon Ball fan, like we all should, because like I said, it's not Dragon Ball Super's fault, it's the writers. Don't blame Dragon Ball Super guys, that show is the victim of corporate assholes. And in this video, we are going to expose the creation that they ruined for us all after wrongfully hyping it up for us every single week. I really, really wanted to like Dragon Ball Super every single episode, every single playthrough, every single day after, but scholars, I've got to ask you the most important question in the history of the Dragon Ball community. What the hell happened? Why is Dragon Ball Super a goddamn disgrace to the Dragon Ball franchise when it should have been a goddamn savior? Well, you're about to find out here today in the greatest, most detailed, and most honest Dragon Ball Super review in the history of the universe. This is going to be that one video that the next generation will refer to when looking back at the history of Dragon Ball Super to actually know the truth. Without the bullshit, without the lies, without the false hype, it will be a feeling of realization like waking up from the Matrix. Painful and shocking at first, but in time, all worth it. So this video is not a hate video, it's not a rant, this video is primarily an information video. I could go on Facebook like a little ass clown and say Dragon Ball Super or Dragon Ball GT sucks and give one line why with a smug smile at the end. But no, I'd rather do things more professionally and give you guys an actual in-depth video just to show you that a lot of thought has gone into this and there are legit reasons. This video was once going to be a brief 15-20 minute video where I would just briefly touch upon some areas, but a video like that leaves a lot of openings for arguments and backfire because I wouldn't be able to explain things properly. There's no point in me just saying the future Trunks arc sucks and then say no more on it, which it did and we all know it did, but if I don't explain it, I don't create a solid foundation to work on to provide reliable information to you. So the 15 minute video idea was scrapped and I decided to go the distance and do it properly for you guys because you, you Dragon Ball fans deserve the truth. This video leaves very little room for counter arguments and you will finally see the goddamn disgraceful catastrophe that Dragon Ball Super is by execution. Not concept, but execution, and there's a huge difference there. I'm not here being paid by the big companies to put Dragon Ball Super in some positive light when it shouldn't be. I'm not here as a fanboy. I'm not here to appeal to the casual masses in hoping of gaining your subscriber number and look cool for liking the in-thing Dragon Ball Super. I'm here as a genuine Dragon Ball fan, and I stand for the Dragon Ball fan that once took on challenges in life with that determined look that Goku would give his enemies in Dragon Ball. That Dragon Ball fan that would try to turn Super Saiyan when lifting his next big dead lift. The Dragon Ball fan who would cry when seeing Vegeta die on Namek. That Dragon Ball fan who would stay up late at night playing Budokai Tenkai G3. That Dragon Ball fan who doesn't give a damn about dubs versus subs, GT versus Super or power scaling. I stand for the Dragon Ball fan who walks through life with that little bit of passion in their heart that Dragon Ball once gave them through storytelling and overcoming the odds. That's who I stand up for in this video. I've been a fan for over 20 years and I've seen a lot to make this judgment here today. That Dragon Ball Super is an absolute soulless garbage cash grabbing product where the bosses now only care about money 
money and lost all of its passion for telling a captivating story that would once send chills down our spines because of how it motivated and inspired us through life. This video is going to be so honest that it will only generate two things, respect or hate. The hate will primarily be from those who refuse to believe it or feelings utterly crushed because they've been defending it for so long in denial. And trust me when I say this, I've got so many points and areas in this video with destructively in-depth explanations that it will make someone's defending nature of Dragon Ball Super look like a complete waste of their life. And let's get one thing perfectly clear. I'm not making this video to hurt someone's feelings about Dragon Ball Super. If they like it, they like it. That's fine. And it's ultimately their choice. You can like something despite it being bad, but you can't deny that it is actually bad. There are reasons why someone would like Dragon Ball Super, but unfortunately, as many of us have seen, there aren't enough good to tilt it in favor over the bad. I'm making this video to help out some fans see everything for what Dragon Ball Super really is through the Super Saiyan Rose tinted glasses to realize just what it actually is you are defended and to reassess the playing field to see if you've been defending it for the right reasons and i'm damn proud of this video on the nostalgia reliant hype fueled soulless cash grab dragon ball super and it's not super's fault it's the writer's fault and if someone doesn't like that honesty i'll see you in the next dimension Before we dive into the ups and downs of Dragon Ball Super, we really need to go back and look where it all began. We need to start the build-up to create some foundation to this huge story. I'm going to be referring to GT in this build-up because it actually plays a huge role at the beginning. After Dragon Ball Z ended and Dragon Ball GT began, the fan base became split because there were mixed reactions about many concepts in GT and the story with fans expecting a more Z-esque delivery. In a nutshell, GT became the dark horse of the series for a long time and did not live up to Dragon Ball and Z. Despite it being a very passionate and respectful series to the original in terms of some of its concepts and story. Dragon Ball was changing, and by the end of Z, it had become a very explosive, fast-paced, action-driven show about transformations that fans became accustomed to, and GT regressed from that and tried to incorporate too much early Dragon Ball with the Z style, and it didn't work very well. And so, the execution of GT is responsible for splitting the fan base there. That is without a doubt, and I am a GT fan, but because Dragon Ball GT became much more noticed with the English dub and Funimation music, many fans did not get a chance to view GT with its original. Japanese dub and soundtrack, which actually caused even more percentage of fans to dislike GT. The English dub and soundtrack did not have the soul that the Japanese did, and if you watch both, you will see the Japanese version is like a whole new product compared to the English. But in the end, that led to GT being further disliked and left a taste in some fans' mouths, many English dub fans, that GT had ruined the franchise and Dragon Ball Z needed saving. But we all know the truth that GT isn't actually solely to blame for the downfall of the Dragon Ball name. Franchise fatigue. It's just some fans gravitate towards that as an easy target and the go-to reason. And it was an excuse to latch onto because GT was the latest in that series after Dragon Ball Z, albeit a different continuity from the one we have now with Dragon Ball Super. Let me take you back to 2013, maybe even sooner than that, where the Dragon Ball name had truly been awakened from a long slumber. Remember those feeling scholars? The chills in older fans who felt Dragon Ball coming back once again. Their childhood back after all these years. And also, the excitement in new generation fans to see what Dragon Ball is all about in this day and age. There was a lot of positivity and hype surrounding the rebirth of Dragon Ball through the Battle of Gods movie. I know it was called Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods, not Dragon Ball Super Battle of Gods, but this basically relates and progresses into Super anyway. Battle of Gods the movie hands down brought Dragon Ball Z back into the game with an outstanding movie, bringing back all the characters with the implementation of new characters and concepts, but delivered the movie with an impressive balance. I praise the Battle of Gods movie. The success of this movie really brought faith back into all fans of Dragon Ball, and it even had some of the classic Goku moments we all know and love. I will not let you destroy my world. It was the Goku we grew up with, the one who never gave up, the one who faced the enemy and stood up for the right reasons. That's the cool stuff we watched Dragon Ball for. And I remember it now. There was an actual initial movement in the Dragon Ball community that this new Dragon Ball storyline is going to make Dragon Ball bigger than it ever was and that it was going to succeed where GT failed. And some fans wanted it to do better just to spite GT and eliminate it from existence, which completely baffles me why someone would want to do that when there were actually tons of fans who loved Dragon Ball GT, especially the Japanese version. But needless to say, Battle of Gods created an uprising in GT haters and a combination of old school and modern fanboys, John 
join together to make sure GT gets completely erased from the community. The next generation Dragon Ball was responsible for that uprising against GT. Unfortunately, it couldn't finish the job, because later in this video you will find out the truth. It was around this year that I recall the words non-canon being infamously thrown around, probably more than it ever did when I was a kid, and it just goes to show you how much a community can enforce a like or dislike for something through numbers alone. Dragon Ball GT was being labelled non-canon and some fans just wanted a new story to go beyond the GT timeline telling new stories, bringing in new characters, etc, etc. And through this Battle of Gods movie, the movie that followed Resurrection F, the new army of Dragon Ball Super, me being one of them at the time, truly thought this was going to create a whole new Dragon Ball from what we had back in the 90s after Dragon Ball Z. And for about two years after Battle of Gods came out, there was a lot of hope in the community and a lot of positivity in general for future content. I wasn't a GT hater back then, I didn't jump on the bandwagon, but the majority of times back then, it truly brings back a lot of good memories about Dragon Ball coming back. At this time, I personally didn't mind if there was a new Dragon Ball Super storyline that replaced GT because I was a fan of both. I wasn't choosing a side, I just wanted more Dragon Ball to enjoy, so I can relive the good old days when I'm even older and remind myself of how much fun I had watching Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Piccolo kick ass once again. That's all I wanted. So when Resurrection F followed two years later as the movie, I'm pretty sure most of you scholars remember the feelings of hearing Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan for the first time, and the movie where Frieza made a return in golden form. This was still called Dragon Ball Z at this point. I believe it was this movie that made me love the new concepts even more than I did previous. The God Powers, the Tranquil Blue Form. The movie was okay, not as good as Battle of Gods, but a decent attempt to add more action to the new story after the Majin Buu Saga. I appreciate the attempts that the makers tried to get Dragon Ball back into the mainstream by promoting two movies. And of course, in the same year of 2015, Dragon Ball Xenoverse was released, and that just made Dragon Ball even more popular to the new generation, while still retaining a lot of its older fans as well. I feel Resurrection F was a little more lighthearted than the first, but I felt there was a bigger safety net to reduce tension. And the most important thing to note at this time in 2015, Dragon Ball Z was popular again, and the community had fully risen up in anticipation for the upcoming series of Dragon Ball Super, where the first episode of Dragon Ball Super aired on July 5th, 2015 on Fuji TV. Dragon Ball Super had truly begun and the hype was stronger than ever. But the hype would not end here because through each passing episode, each arc, the hype just kept going up to the point where I truly feel hype is to blame for a lot of the misunderstanding of believing Dragon Ball Super is the best thing since sliced bread. Hype was a crucial element in keeping fans engaged and tuning in for every new episode of Dragon Ball Super. Episode previews, online discussions, there was a lot of hype. Despite there being a ton of noticeable problems in terms of animation, story and character arcs, without hype, Dragon Ball Super is not the godly masterpiece that many thought it was. In fact, without hype, let me put this in Dragon Ball power scale in terms. Without hype, Dragon Ball Super goes from universal to star level. Like I said, I wanted to like Dragon Ball Super, and you know, there are some things I do like. It's not like I hate all of Dragon Ball Super. I actually wanted it to succeed so much. I was just completely underwhelmed and incredibly disappointed with the final product. A product that should have been superior to itself and previous installments in all shapes and forms, but that opportunity was missed. So before we dive into some heavy hitters, what do I like about Dragon Ball Super? I like the Battle of God saga. I actually love Super Saiyan God, the concept. I liked the concept of the Universe 6 tournament. I like the concept of many things in Dragon Ball Super, including the tranquil Super Saiyan Blue form that took a whole new direction of showcasing power through calmness rather than rage. I liked some of the songs in Dragon Ball Super. They really fired me up in certain scenes. I like the concept of another future arc, and I like the concept of a lot of things including Ultra Instinct. Actually, I love Ultra Instinct, and what it is meant to symbolize in terms of mastering yourself. That state or form or transformation is definitely one of the reasons I would advise someone to check out Dragon Ball Super for that part anyway. I love the Broly movie a lot. I've watched it five times, it's a spectacle. 
despite it being heavily governed by fan terminology such as base form when Goku said that and how Frieza was made to be pure comedy. It was really made with the intention of pleasing modern fans in a cliche way but I still enjoyed it and the awesome movie experience it delivered with the fight scenes. There were tons of cool scenes and attempts to make even Super Saiyan important once again and I can respect that. So yes, I have a lot of time for the Broly movie but that's a review in itself for another day and is not really the anime series that we are going to talk about today of Dragon Ball Super. But I also absolutely love the manga of Dragon Ball Super because it's a completely different ball game to the anime. The manga stands in a different class of entertainment. It's reading something and requires a different type of review compared to watching something as a show. I like the manga despite it having flaws such as a rushed tournament of power, a cluster of a Moro arc and still technically the Goku and Vegeta show. But overall the manga is the better of the two if I'm honest. So you see I do like some of Dragon Ball Super. Having watched the super anime in sub and dub forms three times over each to make a fair analysis, which is more than what I can say for some, especially those who judge GT or super and have never watched them. So just because I'm not a hater and not going to be a fanboy here, that doesn't mean I can't tear Dragon Ball Super apart for a good reason, for all the false hype, lies and corporate ass clowns that promote this show as a success. These points that I do like don't make me like it as a whole though and another primary reason why I'm making this video is because there are some fans out there that think this show is untouchable. 10 out of 10 and a goddamn godsend when in fact that's a complete and utter lie and it needs to be addressed. Dragon Ball Super the anime flopped big time and I'm not talking about money. Just because something makes money and sells toys doesn't make the product good in itself. Ask WWE. But despite all of those aspects that I did like about Super, it just wasn't enough to tilt the scales for me to stand back, look at it with pride and say, you truly were spectacular. Instead, because of most of the things I liked were concepts rather than execution, the only thing Dragon Ball Super made me do was take two steps back and look at it with regret and say, you were truly a goddamn disgrace. I was truly saddened that Dragon Ball Super didn't live up to what I had in mind. I'm not a fan who laughs at it and says it sucks just to make me feel good about another area of Dragon Ball. I'm a fan who could have loved both, but like I said, with open honesty, it did not live up to expectations. And once all the hype faded away during all of its weekly episodes and new arcs, and all the movies and all the news and updates, all that stopped, Dragon Ball Super could be seen in its true form. A soulless failure, a shell of the original Dragon Ball and Z, and couldn't even lace the boots of the concepts, stories, and inspiration in those series. And by the time Super was midway through the series, the hate for GT was at its peak by longtime haters and also some new generation fans who just followed suit, the ones who didn't even watch GT. And by them just listening to the common hater, they followed suit and one by one the Dragon Ball fans gravitated towards the GT hate bandwagon. And this didn't help GT because Super was still airing. The hype was strong, but by the time Super ended, I noticed one of the biggest changes and shifts in momentum in possibly Dragon Ball history. In the beginning, some fans and haters wanted GT to disappear forever, sadly, but after Super ended, many fans actually regressed and saw just how Super did from start to finish, and the results were unbelievable. A shift from hating GT to actually seeing that it wasn't as bad as the haters made out. GT actually became more respected and acknowledged for the good in it than the bad, all thanks to Dragon Ball Super, and that's the ultimate truth. Dragon Ball Super never wanted GT to be wiped out, Haters wanted that to happen, and their toxic nature infected others to believe that too. And the same goes for super haters too, it's a two way street. But what happened was, smart fans started to realize the truth, the Dragon Ball Super was not that savior, it was not that golden egg to surpass Z and supposedly save the Dragon Ball community from GT. No 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 my scholars. Dragon Ball Super served as a purpose to make fans realize just how much passion, spirit and storytelling love went into GT compared to Dragon Ball Super. That it was not all about money and toys and tons of pretty sparkly colors. The fact that moments, development, character progression and captivating stories were what was important in Dragon Ball fans' hearts. And that's what was missing in Super. Fans started to see GT in a new light. When Dragon Ball Super started, the Zero GT plan initiated. But when Super ended, the GT Respect plan began. 
and the fans that changed their opinion actually went and made the effort to watch GT properly and realize what Dragon Ball Super was lacking. But neither of them live up to the greatness of Z and the excellence of the original Dragon Ball. GT split the fan base at one point, but Super divided the fan base further, and through that, lost a lot of its older generation fans in the process. Super fanboys created the Dragon Ball Super vs GT Wars and the GT fanboys carry it on to this day now the Super anime has ended. The truth is, don't be a hater fanboy. If you want to be a fanboy, do it in good light and explain things with good reason. I like GT, I could be considered a fanboy, but I will tell you faster than anybody that a chunk of that show seriously sucked ass and could have been so much better. Point proven. But ultimately, if you're going to take one thing away from this, is that hate of fanboys thought Super was going to be the true death and elimination of GT, when in fact, Super did the opposite and made even more people appreciate GT. And the even bigger truth is, this should not be any GT vs Super Wars. Both fan bases should have joined together and appreciate that there is even more content after Z for different people to enjoy and be happy about it, not be at each other's throats online. I only wish that could have changed. I only wish we could have got good out of it. But no, there will always be arguments online to split the fandom even more. As Super was airing, there was a strong pattern of interest in it that we fans had. That the next episode of Super will be the best episode ever. Every single week I felt that. I kept saying to myself, maybe next week is the week that we will get that episode like we had back in the day of watching Z. The iconic moment that we will talk about for generations. Goku turning Super Saiyan, Vegeta kills 19, Super Saiyan 2 Gohan. Then the next episode preview. Oh my god, this is going to be that one episode. The episode to give us that moment just like that. And... And it never happened. Never to that level we were anticipating. Or from the hype that build up in news and previews. Never. Everything was delivered lackluster and with an emptiness that I can only describe as an episode being written by a man with no soul and focuses on money and lazy attempts to create new wow factors. Some not even making sense. I lived and watched Dragon Ball Super on the hype train, and I couldn't stop myself. The community was hot for it, as episodes passed by weekly. YouTubers going crazy, websites going nuts, but the end results were never ever as big as the hype. Take the Tournament of Power for example, concept idea excellent, hype outstanding, but a piss poor drawn out tournament with tons of questionable decisions, fights and clustered moments not allowing certain characters to actually develop on top of that and introducing a bunch of new peckers that nobody cared about and if there were some they didn't even get a chance. And with Super ending soon after, it was so sudden. Where has all this potential gone? But the actual build-up and anticipation episodes for the tournament, absolutely brilliant. In general, I always felt Dragon Ball Super was a safe show to watch. Think about it, the consequences were just minimum to none. The safety net of big godly characters there in the back pocket for emergencies, Zeno Button, need I say more? This is meant to be the highest, highest of beings. And he's being used as a goddamn who wants to be a millionaire lifeline. Dragon Ball Super is a safe show to watch for casual folks with no tension. You feel like your heroes are always going to be safe and that eliminates good storytelling and caring for characters. You always feel like everything's going to be okay in Super. Whereas when you watch Dragon Ball, Z, GT, if shit hits the fan, you could potentially be losing a character permanently that you care about. As well as that, there was just a huge market ploy for Dragon Ball Super from the get-go, just to sell toys. There was that feeling too. If you think about it, Dragon Ball Super is basically Super Dragon Ball Heroes, just with double the episode time and slowed down pace. Uh, uh, uh. It's an extended promotional anime in itself, promoting new flashy colours and forms to sell toys to sell characters like Kale and Cauliflower, who only have a one-time missed opportunity appearance. It's almost like story wasn't important, but as long as they get all the characters out there for the next generation to invest in through toys and products, that's all that matters. I feel the writers didn't give a damn for the older fans who were loyal to the show for 20 plus years. Instead, the Dragon Ball Supercar ran off fuel being nostalgia and fan service. Adding in moments to the anime that will make old generation fans go, ooh, but in execution they go, ah. Oh. For newer generation fans, it seems that as long as characters are bright and colourful and are able to blow up a bajillion kajillion universes, they're appealing. 
No build-up needed, just superficial writing. Most of the new characters that appeared have as much depth as a plastic toy at the bottom of a cereal box, with the only information we get on them is a little bit of writing on the back of the cereal box. That's as in-depth as new characters go in Super, and I'm not joking. I know there are new generation fans who love good storytelling, and you know something? Good on you guys. I wish the writers could see what matters the most. Dragon Ball Super lacked passion. In order to create this video, I sought the help of other Dragon Ball fans, mainly my subscribers, where I asked them to tell me something about Dragon Ball Super they did not like. And with a staggering amount of replies, and most of them focusing on similar points, I intend to run through a quick list here of areas which are widely considered massive faults with the Super. The points they give are ones that aren't just something small happening in one episode, but it covers a lot of ground which greatly affected pacing, characters, arcs, and the series as a whole. Here are the reasons why the writers and creators completely let Dragon Ball Super down, and this list is in no particular order, and will feel like the tournament of power in terms of structure, so get ready. The animation, cheap plastic animation where godly punches felt so empty. Remember back in the Saiyan Saga and early Dragon Ball when a punch to the gut felt like everything? Well now we get universe busting punches clashing and it looks completely soulless with no tension. Fighters get punched and sent flying and it feels like there's zero pain to the fighters. The anime was so inconsistent too, but one of my biggest gripes was turning someone like Goku, hell, even Tien into skinny versions of themselves. These guys have been training their whole life, and now the art style portrays them like a modern anime hero. They gained skinny teenager syndrome, so it appeals to the younglings of the Dragon Ball community. I really felt like it was Yugi Moto versus Seto Kaiba in some of the fights. Look at Kaiba, that guy is a Saiyan and he's supposed to be a warrior, with power greater than Super Saiyan 2 Gohan, and yet he looks like the last five remaining french fries you see at the bottom of your McDonald's box. And don't get me started on episode 5. Screw the older generation fans, it's all about the new generation and their future interest, pumping their money into the product. That's how I feel Super has been portraying itself. Out with the old and in with the new. The older fans don't count in this day and age. I truly felt like I didn't belong with the series anymore. Every interest that I once had was not in this product by the end of it, only hope. A hope that maybe next week it will go back to how it was. Kind of like how every week I used to watch WWE, hoping the Attitude Era would come back. But it only got worse. Cauliflower and Kale, absolute horrible executions of amazing concepts. And the problem with Cauliflower and Kale is that they were truly wasted and made into cringe characters when they had so much potential. Completely wasted. The recolored forms, absolutely lazy. The Resurrection F arc was just a reuse of storylines and assets. It was such a nostalgic move and didn't serve any major purpose to the story. The fact this movie was a big F you to Vegeta fans also continued the pattern of making Vegeta look like dirt in front of Goku, when in fact there were huge teases after Battle of Gods that Vegeta had got ahead of Goku somewhat, but lead into this disgraceful arc where it should have been Vegeta to avenge himself and his people and his past by defeating Frieza. Heck, fight him first! This is Frieza. The last time Vegeta saw Frieza was when Frieza put a death beam through his chest. We're not counting the time he sensed him coming back to Earth. This storytelling was a market employ to get Goku vs Frieza out there once again like the good old days of Namek, but it made absolutely no sense. Goku fought Frieza because there was nobody left on Namek, but Vegeta's fight was way more personal. And the fact even when he got his shot against Frieza, with his new Super Saiyan Blue form, Frieza still blew up the planet and technically won anyway, and it made for a disgraceful arc and a letdown in terms of fan service to Vegeta fans. That only got worse with time. Furthermore, having Whis reverse time showed us that there were zero consequences once again. Bad, confusing, inconsistent power scaling. Of course, power scaling had become more of a thing now in anime than it ever did back in the day. Universe busting, multiversal, blah blah blah. It has its fan base, but talk about how to completely destroy a show and look at it in a different way. Completely different from how the writers even intended for it to be viewed as, as a cinematic experience. And a poor one at that. Absolutely atrocious power scaling. Due to the whole shock waves will destroy the universe statement by the old Kai, we just have to accept now that everyone who can tangle with Super Saiyan God Goku is ridiculously strong with no real story or character growth logic or sense to how they got that power. They just have that power. That's extreme power, scholars. For someone to wield that power like Goku did in Battle of Gods, they better have a bloody good explanation why. Go on trains in the mountains with Piccolo for one day, one day, and manages to swap punches with pre-tournament of power Goku, Super Saiyan Blue. Some thought, wow, this is cool, Go on is ultimate once again, but 
Ultimate with a Gohan who hadn't trained for ages against Super Saiyan Blue. Not God, Blue. Blah. It's absolutely ridiculous and we just have to accept it for it to make sense despite it being a pathetic cheap power growth with no explanation. Power-ups like that back in the day would have to be considered legendary storytelling. The list goes on and it completely broke in the scaling sense because of certain cinematic moments like shockwaves. In Dragon Ball Super, the apparent power and multiplication of Super Saiyan God wiping out universes should actually mean anyone who was still in the original Dragon Ball Z range should actually be melted away by Super Saiyan God's aura alone. But no, so many things not explained and we have to just believe that everyone got a magic power up bean somehow to make them keep up with these powers. And for the new characters like Cauliflower, their power level to be up there with high tier Super Saiyans, it doesn't even make sense. Think of Goten and Trunks turning Super Saiyan out of nowhere, then magnify that senseless writing by 50. Characters got power-ups for no reason. Back in Z and original Dragon Ball, those power boosts were explained. Loads of unexplained shit, so things just happened. The writing, pacing, and music as a whole was lackluster. The nostalgia pandering with bringing back Frieza and the torn of power arc, which again showed a great reliance on nostalgia to keep fans invested. But the execution and effort was actually goddamn criminal. The treatment of characters is just not taken serious, and the torn of power missed a lot of opportunities to explore certain characters properly and capitalize on them with future stories. The writers backed themselves into a corner so much in that tournament, and the fact the fate of all universes well, eight of them, were treated like a general playtime event for most characters. My goodness, look how serious the Cell games were, or even events on Namek, or previous tournaments in the original Dragon Ball that meant everything but a universe-threatening tournament. It's portrayed like a mad circus with free entry fees. The no blood thing is give or take, but the story of Dragon Ball Super wasn't captivating at all or taken serious, so with the inclusion of no blood as well, only made it feel more safe and less tense to watch. Battle logistics seem to have disappeared. For example, martial arts, conditioning, emotions. They were mentioned, but that was just to put a label on something. As long as they have a new form or shiny aura, they are able to compete in the fight. It's so bland and doesn't feel like the fight in anime it once was. The absence of tension, no battle felt fearsome. There were some good points, but it felt so watered down and parodies of its once great fight in moments in Dragon Ball and Z. There were no more styles, everyone just seemed to have the same basic fighting style, and the only thing that made a difference was power. The only one I can say changed it up was Hit. There may be others, but they weren't popular. But in the Tournament of Power, Goku tried to use some tactics against Jiren with a Destructo Disc and the key minefield. And just like Dragon Ball Super does, it falsely makes something look impressive just for it to flunk in the end. It's so pointless, and tactics like that would have definitely worked back in the day. And it was the Goku show. For once I will agree, many seem to bring up GT for Goku's time, but Super didn't really change that, did they? At least GT admits it's all about Goku's final journey and ended it correctly, whereas Super made it out to be about everyone, but sneakily still centered it all around Goku, heavily. It really is the Goku and Vegeta show. Everyone else really doesn't make a difference in the long run. The show tries to make out they do care, but it really doesn't long term. Humans are a goddamn disgrace, unfortunately, and if you're an Amekian, you're even worse. Ribrian, potentially the most annoying character in the history of Dragon Ball that took up way more screen time than she deserved. So it was meant to be annoying on purpose, yes? Well, that screen time could have been used on characters who meant something to us, like Tien or Yamcha, and focus on those guys. She could have been fine, but she overstayed her welcome in such a crucial time. There were so many cronies in the Tournament of Power that it just felt so irrelevant or annoying. The copy of Vegeta arc was a goddamn disgrace. It made the Garlic Jr. arc look like the Namek saga. And Goten and Trunks, my word, two characters who had far more development in GT. But in Super, these guys don't seem to age. They are made out to be useless and inferior. Despite being handpicked, chosen by Goku in the Buu saga to take on the strongest enemy even at that point. These little guys were supposed to be better from there when they were older, but they regressed so much and weren't even chosen for the Tournament of Power. I'm sorry, but those two Super Saiyans and a fusion capability, I would take them over Master Roshi any day. And a few others too for that matter. That level of power would have smashed way more enemies, minus the ass pull plot power-ups. And yes, a 30 minute fusion takes up nearly the full time for the Tournament of Power anyway. But do the writers think about that stuff? Probably not. Goten and Trunks, the future generation, were wasted to the point that all we as fans can do is shake our heads. The lack of use of these two in Dragon Ball Super was probably one of the biggest FUs to us fans from the writers. When Gotenks did appear, the usage of him was criminal. It made Fusion look pathetic. 
God key, overhyped, and didn't matter in the end. The God forms felt cheapened the further into the series it went. The impact they failed to show was disrespectful to the concept. The retelling of Battle of Gods and Resurrection F before moving on. As much as I like Battle of Gods, having to move into the episodes where it was just an extensive retelling really made Dragon Ball Super lose a lot of its momentum straight away. It wasn't until the Universe 6 tournament took place that the show started to pick up its momentum once again. Kefla, an incredibly powerful character only to be portrayed like an annoying asshole. A really disappointing run with a female fusion. Frieza being made into a comedy character, completely ruining the character and nature that made him Frieza in the first place, and then giving him the ass pull of a power-up. Twice, just to make him relevant to the plot. Frieza was iconic before Dragon Ball Super, now he's just another common player in the game of Dragon Ball Monopoly. A prime example of how Super relies heavily on nostalgia to draw in fans with a false sense of excitement and interest. But boy oh boy, the ass pulls. The ass pulls. And the fan service was there for the sake of fan service. Freezer going from Namek Saga to Super Saiyan Blue in only four months of training was such a lazy way to make him stronger. And there were so many retcons not being able to stick to a basic structure of storytelling. Prime example of this was Vegito Blue and the Potari usage. And boy, did they screw our boy Vegito up hard on his arrival. It was all hype and no satisfying result. I cannot tell you how disappointed myself and many people were that I've spoken to about Vegeta's lack of performance in Super. It made Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta's appearance look iconic. The retconning of Potari earrings was the worst in my opinion, as it just made Vegito no different than Gogeta besides name and look. It was supposed to be the superior fusion, and the retcon makes absolutely no sense. Plot. Plot destroyed Potara. The disrespectful use, or should I say misuse, of Majin Buu. Slim Buu? Come on, this guy would have been epic and a blast to see in the tournament of power. But no, we get the Ginyu Force wannabes, the Pride Troopers. Such a cringeworthy group. Some Slice of Life episodes were okay, but most felt so out of place. And they didn't capitalize on Slice of Life episodes after battles too much, and how the battles affected them. Like when Goku had the key disorder, that should have lasted much longer than it did, and should have affected him much more. But an episode later, he's back, and he's wielding Kaioken times 20. What the hell happened there? See what I mean by unexplained ass balls? Using the Kaioken times 10 on blue like he did, should have meant if he tried it again, he may actually lose a limb or three. But no, break those limits, Goku. Keep making sure you never actually have a peak. So unrelatable. And so boring. The overall aura of Super feels too childish. When someone gets blasted through the chest, all they do is spit, like when Goku got maimed by Zamasu. He was still fighting. There needs to be more consequences in battle, like a broken friggin' arm with Vegeta and Z. It was affecting him so much and you saw it. You saw how much pain he was in. But get gutted and leave a hole in your lungs? Nah, you're okay. Just use your god key, bro. Characters didn't feel damaged. There was way too much comedy, especially during the presence of gods as well. The other gods of destruction and angels just oversaturated the product so much. Having Beerus and Whis, okay, Shamper and Varus was fine, but all the others, I can't even remember their names. It's pointless. And don't get me started on the Omni King. That character symbolized just who the product is aimed for. The concepts. My goodness, the concepts were so awesome. The Universe 6 tournament, the death of Goku by Hit, but in the end, the writing just saves the day and ruins what could have been epic, unique, impact for writing to explore and take chances with new material. But no, we get the same old safe writing. The Universe 6 characters are all a waste, especially the Saiyans, but in regards to concepts, some haters go on about GT having good concepts and bad execution, and I agree for some of that, but not all. But all the concepts in Dragon Ball Super, all of them were amazing. But all of them were executed badly. More than GT. It's so ironic. There weren't any real true villains apart from Zamasu in the anime, and he was let down by a poor arc. This show relies heavily to retcon the original ending of Dragon Ball Z. Why someone would want to go back 20 years and edit something iconic is beyond me. How about stop pretending like the end of Z needs to be retconned to justify the crap that happens in Super, and rather accept the fact the writers made Super have bad writing, period, and will not sync up to the end of Z, with consistency leading to Super actually feeling less of a sequel to the Majin Buu saga than GT ever did. GT truly feels like a superior sequel, with more consistency despite its bad start, and that truth hurts like hell. Another thing was that I didn't feel any sadness in Dragon Ball Super. I didn't feel like I cared for anyone's suffering, or lack thereof. Not like when Trunks cried when future Gohan died, you know? Stuff like that. I always felt everything will be okay because of Goku's cheery, stupid face in dangerous circumstances. At least in Z and original Dragon Ball, Goku knew when it was a dangerous time, and he knew when it was a friggin' dangerous time. 
Jiren, the ultimate obstacle, had such a lackluster story and it felt so rushed. Crammed in there about approval from his former master. I couldn't give a damn to be honest. I would take one Krillin over a hundred Jirens any day because we've been told Krillin's story properly. We know him and we know what he's been through. We've seen his pain and deaths. You just can't tell us something happened and expect us to care. Again, poor execution. You have to show it and explain it and let us experience it. And you know some of the designs of these new characters like Dispo, looking like Beerus, and even Kale's legendary form resembling Broly, they were either so lazy or depended heavily on nostalgia to get them over. That stupid button. Most of the filler episodes were absolute garbage and a waste, especially for a series that offered very little in its main arcs. The lack of use of Beerus. The main newest addition to Super, he was portrayed as lazy and whenever the next big villain showed up, he would always have a stupid shocked look on his face about their power until finally, there's fighters who have potentially surpassed him in the tournament of power like Jiren. And we never got to see Beerus' true potential surface. Bearing in mind, that takes me back to the terrible retcons once again going on in the Battle of God saga. One minute the narrator is basically saying Beerus is maxed out, the next minute Whis is saying he's not. It's so confusing. What is true? Beerus was such a goddamn waste. Android 17 and his giant ass pull of a power up from being a park ranger. It's so laughable. Despite some fans loving Android 17, I like him, but this story sense is bullshit. He purely gained this power for plot purposes. Why isn't 18 this strong? It just goes to show you that the writers do not know what the hell they are doing or writing. They just stick to nostalgic acts in the show and say deal with it. People like 17. This will draw in the fans and their money. <laughs> I know I said I liked the Broly movie, but Retcon in the Bardock special was one that especially annoyed me as it fit in perfectly with the original Dragon Ball storyline and was referenced by Toriyama in the manga. What makes it worse, it was replaced by a more dumbed down lukewarm story. Let me talk about the ending for just a moment. Whoever thinks the ending was good or even more bizarre thinks it's a better ending than Z or GT really needs to take a look in the mirror. The ending of Dragon Ball Super was not even a cliffhanger. It was an underwhelming exit where we just say, wait, was that it? You know, like a film that ends suddenly when you were just getting ready for something to happen. Just like that. I mean, if you're going to cross the GT timeline and erase it, do it properly or not at all. Even the ending of Super relied heavily on nostalgia with Goku facing Vegeta in the mountains, like old times. Whoever says GT's ending was only good because we liked Dragon Ball Z is actually, actually right. But the only reason anybody would like the Super ending is for the exact same reason. But most of us see the truth. It wasn't really an ending. It was more of a sharp exit out of this mess, like it never happened. And some of me wishes that was true. So now I've gone through some basic issues with Dragon Ball Super, it's time for me to go through some in-depth problems with the series. And these ones will be explained in more detail because I feel they are the biggest problems. Let us begin. Enter Dragon Ball Super, enter Godly Powers, enter Super Saiyan God, enter Super Saiyan Blue, enter Super Saiyan Rose, enter Super Saiyan Rage, enter Ultra Instinct, and say goodbye to Super Saiyan 3. Let's have Beerus just finger flick that form into obsolescence once and for all, and especially Super Saiyan 2 and Super Saiyan 1. What many fans don't realize is, they believe Super Saiyan 2 was actually praised high in Dragon Ball Super as it was used much more in battle, more than Super Saiyan 3. This is completely false, as if you look at it with all of your senses, Super Saiyan 2 was merely a warm-up form, teasing that the battles weren't even serious. Where, when you look at Gohan vs Cell, that battle was life and death. Super Saiyan 1 is probably non-existent in most of Dragon Ball Super, until we get to the real major problem in Dragon Ball Super. The one story element, which was the total disgrace and downfall for everything that the original Super Saiyan form stood for and that which ultimately spat on the original concept of Super Saiyan. Enter Cauliflower and the Tingly Back Theory. Seriously, go to hell with that right in Akira Toriyama. If the original Super Saiyan concept requires an emotional trigger or struggle to become a Super Saiyan, then my trigger is seeing Cauliflower and how she achieved Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2. It really pisses me off as a fan. And the thing is, it pisses a lot of you guys off too. I really wanted to like Cauliflower when she first arrived. The Saiyan Prodigy. She had so much potential to take her own path, 
and really have us fans believe in the universe six Saiyans for their own unique stories and struggles. But the problem was, the way she was written had her take original developed meaningful Super Saiyan concepts and then use them like some cheap parlor trick to advance her powers, with the idea that her tingly back helps her transform. Thanks Kaba. Although Kaba's Super Saiyan transformation had some sort of meaning behind it when Vegeta pushed him, it just wasn't enough. It didn't have what the original four Super Saiyans had. It lacked emotional attachment. Kaba's busy crying about his planet. I don't know a single thing about his planet or his people. I couldn't give a damn about them all because it's never been told to me on an emotional level. It was a poorly written transformation at a time where Super Saiyan was inferior. And Cauliflower's was a mockery of the once great Super Saiyan form. And it ultimately mocked the struggles of Goku, Vegeta, Gohan and Trunks back in Dragon Ball Z. Some fans call her a prodigy and that's why she can learn things quickly, but we can't use that reason in place for bad writing. I really hope, really hope that Cauliflower just wasn't put there in the fighter lineup to appeal just to female fans. I really hope it was not the whole I am woman hear me roar thing where the writers just gave Cauliflower all of the big power ups and forms just to have a female character somewhat catch up with the male warriors. Actually a big part of me really believe the writers did that and it's a damn shame the way they did that and devalued something as cherished as Super Saiyan to achieve a female Saiyan fighter. But let's be honest. Any true Dragon Ball Z fan would realize there was no pressure to bring a strong female in out of nowhere. Android 18 had already made her mark back in the Android saga and was the first big female fighter that could totally crush a Super Saiyan form in an instant. Did people forget that? Did the writers forget that? She was the one who single-handedly took the title away from Super Saiyan and took it away from Vegeta, the prince of all Saiyans. But ultimately, what led to the original Super Saiyan's downfall was the introduction of Super Saiyan God and Blue. Two forms which were Dragon Ball Super's go-to forms for serious moments. Now, Blue tried to incorporate the original Super Saiyan form, which I can respect. And I have no problems with the God forms as they each have their own merit. The same goes with Ultra Instinct, the form or technique which was the pinnacle of Whis's training and was part of the whole Dragon Ball Super story by the end of it. Ultra Instinct had become what Super Saiyan originally was by the end of the Freezer Saga and early Android Saga. It was the form which was Dragon Ball's highest praised horse and would damn right be protected at any cost. There were a number of times where the Super Saiyan form was attempted to be saved and to bring prestige back to the form once again. The time where Gohan turned Super Saiyan against the wolf in the tournament exhibition, that was a cool moment and tried to emphasize what Super Saiyan was a bit more. Even in the new Broly movie when Vegeta had an epic Super Saiyan transformation, it really tried to showcase the importance behind it to all fans once again, especially to newer fans who weren't familiar with the original Super Saiyan concept. But the problem was, as cool as these efforts were, to true fans, Super Saiyan had already been remarkably damaged to the point of no return. I forgot to mention the new S-Cells theory of the Super Saiyan. Yep, the new midichlorian theory by the head honcho himself, Akira Toriyama, who explains S-Cells of being the pathway to a Super Saiyan. Basically saying, this means that no matter how hard you train or how angry you get, if you don't have enough S-Cells, you cannot become a Super Saiyan. And to me, that destroyed the awesome mystery of the whole Super Saiyan legacy by bringing in some crappy scientific theory which made us overthink a concept that is actually very simple yet appealing. Rage, anger, emotion, need, desperation, boom, Super Saiyan. It was perfect the way it was. Remember Goku, Vegeta, Gohan and Future Trunks all transforming during their time of desperation? Yeah, screw that. We got ourselves some S-cells, bro. Throughout Dragon Ball Super, after Battle of Gods, I can only count two times Super Saiyan 3 was utilized. Once against Trunks in the backyard of Capsule Corp, leading to me thinking, what is the point anymore? Why imply to us through the new God forms that Super Saiyan 3 is rendered useless, then bring Super Saiyan 3 back in a demonstration of power against Trunks, as if Goku was ever going to use that form if it would be enough to stop Goku Black? Let's get real, the writers would never allow such an outdated disappointing form to be the victor at this point in the show. It's all about the new flavours of the month and the wheel keeps on turning. Seeing Super Saiyan 3 against Trunks was done for one thing, to please Super Saiyan 3 fans like ourselves and get us to shut up. 
Well, I'm sorry, but that's not how you respect the transformation, by giving it a meaningless appearance. Same with the Tournament of Power, showing it against Cauliflower and Kale. As awesome as Goku looked, him standing there, it was a complete pointless experience. Why have Cauliflower and Kale aim for three when Super Saiyan God and Blue are just vastly superior at that point? Heck, to prove my point on that, even Vegeta laughed at Trunks when he mentioned about Super Saiyan 3. And that solidified in Dragon Ball Super that Super Saiyan 3 was indeed not even practically needed to get stronger. The appearance of Super Saiyan 3 in the Tournament of Power was just a retro moment, albeit pointless. It didn't even have a battle in the tournament. Complete disrespect by the writers on that part. I'm not even going to talk about the animation of early Dragon Ball Super that just made Super Saiyan 3 look even worse. Wow, I'll never forget that time. What a complete difference to the original Dragon Ball Z artwork. We get Universe 6. Oh, but their tails are non-existent. Just an evolution process. Now don't get me wrong, it's nice having different concepts or directions, but really, this has to be some of the most laziest, disloyal writing ever when referring to the Saiyan power. That was so important in Dragon Ball, and mainly Dragon Ball Z at the beginning. Just to say, ah well, Saiyans don't have tails anymore. There, done. Nail in the coffin. It's not like they went into any different directions with the Universe 6 Saiyans anyway. Not ways that really counted. For God's sake, they still obtained Super Saiyan, which didn't really give them any individuality anyway. Just another Super Saiyan bargain sale, but not even acknowledging Tails or a great ape heritage. I don't know about all of us, but I know many of us feel like this was a big slap in the face. A big slap of betrayal to the original Saiyan concepts. And why? Because it doesn't fit the formula of Dragon Ball anymore? Great apes aren't allowed in this God and Angel game anymore? Of course, it's all about pretty lights and flashing colours now in Dragon Ball. Forget the primal say in Roots and Law. As long as you have God Key, you can join the Cool Kids Club. Perhaps the Uzaru or Great Apes would ditch because they wouldn't appeal to modern day kids. Perhaps the God Forms and flashy universe busting explosions is the only way to make kids interested in the show now. With ever growing universal powers and explosions in multiverses. Forget classic storytelling and Saiyan history when it was at one time really important. A 10 times multiplier doesn't cut it anymore, guys. If you don't have a times billion multiplier on your base form, nobody is interested in you. Is that really what Dragon Ball has become? Maybe multipliers did really make the Uzaru form irrelevant, unintentionally, because it just wouldn't make no difference in battles anymore when it comes to battle power. But truth be told, with so much going on in Dragon Ball and so many concepts coming in, old concepts have to retire and it's just the way of the game. There is no room for an Uzaru in Dragon Ball anymore, unfortunately, and that's how I feel, and it's just a sad feeling. Gots to sell those new toys, huh? Overall, some love giant monster battles like Godzilla blasts coming out from their mouths and throwing massive boulders and cities exploding. I'm one of them, as long as it's done in moderation, but some don't like that, and they prefer sleek, slender battle fight scenes. But in Dragon Ball, if I'm honest, it's okay to have both and maintain the prestige of something as interesting and important as the Great Ape, unless we count the nod to the Uzaru in the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie where Broly harnesses its power. But are we really crediting the Uzaru power for Broly's strength? Or are we crediting Broly for Broly's strength? It's freaking Broly. At that point in the show, on a rampage, nobody cares about the Uzaru. We are thinking about Broly's power. And what I will say right now, when I first heard about this form, when I saw it as well, I was actually very, very interested. Super Saiyan God, how are Saiyans linked to gods? Teases going years back to the legend of the first Super Saiyan God, and it all started to tie in nicely. And the movie of Battle of Gods itself was a true success in my eyes, to get Dragon Ball Z back out there for old and new fans to equally enjoy. Super Saiyan God, with the design that stemmed away from the over-the-top designs, keeping it just like Goku's base with the addition of the fiery god Liora in here, and giving him a leaner look. Although I was more of a fan of the bigger jacked up versions of Goku to emphasize his training over the years, the lean style made Super Saiyan God stand out from the other forms, and added a ton of new potential and godly power to Goku which he obtained through the Super Saiyan God ritual and could now use divine level energy. The form appeared to have a bright future, almost as bright as its look. But with that being said, what the hell happened? Why has the Super Saiyan God transformation become a disgrace and a flash in the pan? Well, you're about to find out.
Battle of Gods aired in Japan on March 30th, 2013, and I don't recall nothing major happening in Dragon Ball news until two years later on April 18th, 2015, when Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F was then the next film in the Dragon Ball Resurgence to air. Now you can look at Resurrection F as a success if you want, but in terms of story, it was playing on nostalgia and added the fan service of bringing back Frieza. The biggest problem with Resurrection F was bringing in another transformation for Goku, and this time Vegeta 2. Need I remind you, Dragon Ball Super had not started airing its episodes yet. There was still a couple of months to go before its original run on July 5th, 2015, as far as I can recall. The problem in itself was the movie came off Battle of Gods, where at the end of that movie, the Super Saiyan God transformation had a huge appearance and albeit failed the job of defeating Beerus, there was a more important message, and that was Goku still had a long way to go to utilize that power. And that was great. At the time coming off Dragon Ball Z with Goku being the hero alongside Vegeta, you didn't want that to be all for them. And we wanted to see them continue their training journey, and this was a great addition for us. Super Saiyan God still had mountains to be explored. And I'm talking about just the form in itself. Tons of godly techniques to discover, mastering the form itself through training, seeing it battle different opponents. Those were the things we wanted to see more out of Super Saiyan God. It was like unfinished business at the end of Battle of Gods, like Rocky 1. You wanted to see a Rocky 2 with a stronger Super Saiyan God versus Beerus. But what happened? We get Resurrection F. Replace the threat of Beerus with Frieza once again, and give Frieza the biggest ass pull of a power-up in the history of Dragon Ball, catching up to a post-Boo Saga Goku all of a sudden. Anyway, if that wasn't the big thing, Resurrection F promotes the almighty Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan, or Super Saiyan Blue. But the problem with introducing the so-called Super Saiyan God with the power of a Super Saiyan was that it was too much, too damn fast. Like imagine Goku getting Super Saiyan on Namek against Frieza, then a few episodes later he gets Super Saiyan 2 against Frieza, like faster than that. And it gave Super Saiyan God no time to develop. Instead, it was instantly suffocated by this new blue hairy coloring of the original Super Saiyan. And that's all it was in terms of design. Super Saiyan 1 with blue hair. But of course, the blue form is much stronger than Super Saiyan God, all after Whis's training, and this was a huge mistake because we saw no progression of Super Saiyan God at all. Instead, Goku and even Vegeta now are wielders of blue, and we as an audience are just there made to accept the fact now that they can do that without getting us to witness much of their struggles or growth. The fact Goku hated achieving the God power in the Battle of Gods movie the way he did was a brilliant show of development for his character and sparked a motivation in him to achieve that power on his own, which I liked as a fan, and the battle with Beerus was such an adrenaline pump. Instead, with Frieza's new golden power stated to be even higher than blue, it meant that Frieza, of all fighters, would massively triumph over that fantastic new Super Saiyan God transformation that helped resurface Dragon Ball from its slumber. That fiery red form, now lost in the shuffle, now being overshadowed by blue indirectly. It's now a memory of the past, and it didn't even have time to shine properly. I actually don't think we even see Super Saiyan God in Resurrection F at all. It would have been great if we saw Vegeta obtain it, and spend a bit more time in that form before moving on to something else. Heck, you know what? Better writing for the Resurrection F movie would have been to never introduce Blue in the first place, and they should have just focused on Super Saiyan God being the primary form for Goku and Vegeta, where they're striving to master it. That would have been the perfect pace. Battle of Gods is achieving the form, Resurrection F is mastering the form, which means they could have still beat Frieza using form expertise than pure power. Too much too soon. Of course, Goku is the poster boy to have the form in Battle of Gods, but Resurrection F would have been 10 times better if it was Vegeta's show and he obtained the Super Saiyan God, and that would have been poetry for Vegeta to beat Freezer, but a Saiyan God, and it's the Prince. Eat that, you tyrant. Now, in the Dragon Ball Super anime, I will give them credit for giving Super Saiyan God a lovely looking transformation sequence and spending a bit of extra time with the form in the Beerus fight. Props there. Also, some cool, unique healing ability. I mean, wow, this form had its own potential to be explored. Such a mystery that could have been drawn out a bit longer to keep us drooling for more, but it just seems like it was scrapped. Everything. Except we get boring blue. I don't think it ever really appeared until, forgive me if I'm wrong, but the Tournament of Power in the anime? I mean, I guess they did try to use it here and there, but by that point, if I'm honest guys, Goku had way too many forms under his belt at that point, including the blue Kaioken amp, which made Super Saiyan God the Super Saiyan 3 of Dragon Ball Super. It became a form right in the middle where there's no real point in it anymore. Super Saiyan 2 was the warm-up form to gauge fighters' powers, and Blue was a serious form. Kaioken Blue was for extreme situations, meaning Super Saiyan God had just been rendered obsolete, and it was too late for it despite attempts for cool moments against Kale and Cauliflower. But I mean, look at Jiren blocking Super Saiyan God. 
What a way to kill a form. The same thing with the Broly movie. Super Saiyan God looks so good on screen. Heck, I'd even say it looks better than Super Saiyan Blue. There's something about it. But you knew in the back of your mind that it was just a pointless level before Blue in the movie. It almost looked like God would have been much better as the top end form in that movie instead of Blue. Imagine seeing Gogeta God. You know, that would have been more prestigious in my eyes. Super Saiyan Blue murdered Super Saiyan God. And with that notion, you knew Super Saiyan God was just a punch bag for the new badass Broly. Look how disrespected the legendary Super Saiyan God is right here, against a Saiyan who can't even go Super Saiyan yet. This is meant to be Super Saiyan God. Think about that name a second when it was first introduced to us, the form that brought Dragon Ball Z back into the world strongly. Meh, whatever. The wheel keeps on spinning. Money, 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 money. So let's quickly discuss the manga of Dragon Ball Super. Now, the manga portrayal is different, and I will give them credit for utilizing Super Saiyan God with more effort. But when we look back at it, was it really treated with prestige? I mean, how we portray the anime will always transfer over to the manga in how we feel about it. I mean, look at this. Chapter 4, Super Saiyan God appeared. Chapter 5, Super Saiyan Blue is introduced. You see the problem there? Within a chapter, two god transformations have already made Goku and Vegeta's forms a cluster. In the fight against Hit, nobody really cared about Super Saiyan God because the hype was already spawned to see Super Saiyan Blue in action. What a counterproductive move. Next, in the Goku Black arc, they try to have Vegeta surprise Goku Black by remaining in Super Saiyan God while he switches to Blue for the instant hits. But the problem with that is they are still making Blue the prime win condition, where Super Saiyan God is just there waving at everyone. And as soon as Perfected Blue came along in the manga, kiss Super Saiyan God goodbye once and for all. And it only gets worse for Super Saiyan God. You get the obstacle that is Ultra Instinct. And now on Yardrat, Vegeta has his new spirit control. You know there's going to be much more. Super Saiyan God has just been kicked into the dirt along with Super Saiyan 3, where both of those forms can now hold their hands, realizing how bad they've been treated. There's probably more that I could cover, but I'll leave it there. In a nutshell, Super Saiyan Blue murdered Super Saiyan God. Too damn much, too damn fast, too damn soon. And not enough time to let Super Saiyan God expand and grow and staple itself in history with tons of cool, meaningful moments. If it was me writing Dragon Ball Super, I would have kept Super Saiyan God as the pinnacle transformation for Goku and Vegeta all of the way up to the Tournament of Power, where Ultra Instinct would be the only means of surpassing it. Farewell Super Saiyan God, I liked you. You will always remain in my memory as the form that had incredible writing potential, and one of the most mysteriously divine concepts that went back to the Saiyan history, but now you're nothing more than an old toy in Sid's bedroom. Super Saiyan Blue, or Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan. It is a form and transformation in the Dragon Ball Super anime and manga that combines the brand new power of Super Saiyan God with the original Super Saiyan classic, creating a whole new level of power. I mean, Super Saiyan God, the form that helped revive Dragon Ball from a huge sleep with Battle of Gods, and was a power that could do universal level craziness in its first test against Beerus. But top that power up with a Super Saiyan and boom, we were set to be in for some serious stuff, with the form sporting the tranquil blue look, to emphasize a calm nature and focus of the new incredible power, taking it in a different direction than recklessly wasting key, being trained under an angel to help ascend that power even further, and adding one blue Vegeta to the mix with Goku. But with all that that potential, all that godly hype. What the hell happened? Why has Super Saiyan Blue become a disgrace and the biggest failure of a form in Dragon Ball history? Far worse than Super Saiyan 3. Even with Blue having everything lined up for it to be a success, how did Super Saiyan Blue go from transformation to trash formation? How did they screw it up that much? Well, you're about to find out how Super Saiyan blew it. Let's continue to the debut of Super Saiyan Blue in the anime first. The concept of Super Saiyan Blue was actually interesting. Believe me when I say this, I tried to like Super Saiyan Blue, I really tried. But the further into the series I got, the more it appealed less to me. Why did I initially like it? Well, Toriyama says the Blue expressed how, by overcoming a certain limit, he has become both strong and tranquil, able to keep his composure in a fight. And I love this about Blue. It separated it from the other forms. Despite this form literally being a palette swap of the original Super Saiyan 1 and appearing very lazy in design, I could make do with it initially due to the concept of tranquility. But again, the more the series progressed, the more disappointed I became. The more the lazy design just irritated me. How did it get this way? 
when the Resurrection F movie was released, Dragon Ball Super episodes hadn't even started yet. So let's try to go back to a time and remember those feelings of experiencing Super Saiyan Blue for the first time and how much we felt like it was just another transformation shoved down our throats, only for the God's honest truth of it being there primarily to grab the attention of us, sell the movie and make lots of money through that and merchandise sales by sacrificing passionate character development and good Dragon Ball pacing. So right off the bat, we already had a bad taste in our mouths from the marketing standpoint. What is Dragon Ball if it doesn't relate to us or invest in our feelings for how we care about something? Why is the original Super Saiyan form still close to our hearts even to this day despite it being outclassed every single saga after? It's because there was build up. It's because the form had impact. It's because we were emotionally invested. When introducing a brand new transformation, literally one movie after the first big transformation was introduced, you could say Super Saiyan Blue had a lot of pressure on it to make an impact. With new transformations, we expect some impact from them. We expect some memorable badass moments that would forever solidify a form into the history books as being a big deal. Did Super Saiyan Blue do this? Absolutely not. And here's why. We get Goku and Vegeta getting a feel for this power in Whis's training before they arrive on the battlefield. And I'll be honest, the build up to achieving this form was underwhelming and didn't draw in my emotions at any level. I felt quite empty seeing this build up of Whis teaching Goku and Vegeta basic principles that they should already know, especially Goku after training as a kid. Empty, empty training sequences. Next, they arrive on the battlefield and Lord behold, the villain is Frieza. Another perfect example of how a company plays with our nostalgia to get us invested. And if that wasn't all, giving Frieza an ass pull of a power up, putting him leaps and bounds above some fighters who would have ruined his ass post Namek Saga was a bad move. No need to explain his growth, it's Frieza and he never normally trains and that's it. That's the explanations we are given because that's all we deserve in the owner's eyes. They are basically telling us to sit down, shut up and deal with it. It's Freezer. They don't care about our emotions and what we think about the franchise in terms of a story. Not anymore. As long as we paid that dollar, they've already won. No matter how bad the writing. Anyway, for someone like Freezer arriving post Freezer saga, it would have been Z logic for even Goku's base form to whip Freezer, let alone even turn in Super Saiyan 1. But no, we don't even get Super Saiyan 3 or Super Saiyan God. We get the next level up again, Super Saiyan Blue. And with actually a lovely transformation sequence showcasing its calmness, I was starting to think, wow, this all better be worth it. This is another step above Super Saiyan God, the form that just opened up new worlds of power. Oh, and then it starts. Golden Freezer, okay. One extra power up for Freezer. That realistically shouldn't even make Super Saiyan 1 Goku sweat, right guys? But instead, it treats Super Saiyan Blue like absolute dog crap for a while. I'm telling you, the Resurrection F fighting made Freezer look like the badass and made Blue look like a waste of time. Oh, but the stamina. Blue is about the stamina. Well, it originally was until much later in the series. It's actually the polar opposite. Don't use Blue or you use too much stamina. Are they trying to make us look stupid? Look, stamina advantage or not, it begins to overcome Freezer, but the problem with this was it took too damn long. The Super Saiyan Blue form should have entered the battlefield and destroyed the opponent. It would have showcased the progression of Goku and Vegeta ever since the God form, but no, it barely overcomes Freezer. Luckily, because he hadn't been accustomed to his Golden form, which doesn't make an impact at all. Resurrection F tries to make Blue look cool by having Goku take a punch to the face by Freezer, followed by the one inch punch. But the way Goku gets caught off guard was a complete joke and totally overshadowed Goku's victory. In fact, he didn't even look victorious. Super Saiyan Blue looked like it failed. Stamina advantage or not, this is what we remember. Blue fall into the ground thanks to the frickin' laser. Thanks for the memory. Oh, but then we get to Vegeta using blue. Fantastic. Is it just me or did this feel very pointless in the end? Another Super Saiyan Blue fighter on a weakened freezer. Way to make Vegeta look like the guy who deals with the leftovers. That's not what Vegeta deserved. He deserved a fight from the get-go. And he should have finished the job. That's the Resurrection F we all wanted. But no, to add the insult to injury to the pointless Super Saiyan Blue appearance, Freezer wins by destroying the Earth anyway. Yes, apart from the Angel intervention, Blue failed miserably. And against Freezer of all villains. Not only that, the one good thing to come out of this movie was Vegeta's beatdown on Freezer, and even that was taken away by Goku jumping in to save the day with pitiful writing. Resurrection F was a failure, no matter how much it earned. It failed to deliver originality, it failed to deliver a form with impact, it failed to deliver a satisfying result, it failed to deliver character development worth investing in. Resurrection F failed. Super Saiyan Blue failed. 
Imagine a WWE wrestler making his debut and losing his first match. Nobody cares from there. Those with sense will understand this. Those in complete denial will defend Super Saiyan Blue because of the sole reason they don't want to feel disappointed. Well guys, we all must wake up and it's better to face the truth and be disappointed at Super Saiyan Blue's debut than live a lie for the rest of our lives. The same pattern would persist from the movie into the episodes of Dragon Ball Super. Now let us begin the Upgrade Blues, Upgrade Blues protocol of Super Saiyan Blue. Because if the previous forms weren't already rendered obsolete due to Blue, Blue makes a laughing stock of itself in the upcoming Universe 6-7 tournament when Goku and Vegeta can't get the job done with this new incredible God form. Yeah, because God forms matter, right guys? Clearly not. The tournament showed this. Not only does Blue fail yet again, but in order to make it relevant, the anime has to give Goku the Kaioken amp and play with our nostalgia even more. Another prime example of how we were tricked into believing something was awesome because the Kaioken Blue failed again. Oh, but sure, it's powerful, right? And had cool moments. Yeah, 10 times the Blue power, multi, multi, universal to the power of 10. Nobody cares. It failed against Hit and left the regular blue form in the dirt even more. As Dragon Ball fans, we look back on that moment and say, hey, Goku had an awesome power-up moment, but then lost, no matter how strong it was meant to be. But it only gets worse for the Super Saiyan Blue form from here. Because we get the copy Vegeta Saga, yuck, not touching that. We get the Future Trunks Saga. And I've never known a saga to devalue a form more than this one. I thought the Boo Saga made Super Saiyan 1 and 2 look like crap, but the Future Trunks arc made Super Saiyan Blue look much worse. A form with so much hype and with so much training behind it becomes fodder against the new Super Saiyan Rose. Oh, video coming for that one soon as well. Goku and Vegeta showcase their blue power, which makes zero difference. And already coming into the arc with no momentum, Super Saiyan Blue is now going in reverse. Because then you get Super Saiyan 2 Trunks of all characters able to leap over the power gap that this godly blue gave Goku and Vegeta. What is the point of God Key again? So now Blue goes further down the ladder until Vegeta trains a little, comes bouncing back with some little strength. Sorry Prince, but the damage is already done to the form, you fool. Immediately after this comes the greatest insult of all, Vegito Blue. You remember Vegito, right guys? Yeah, Super Vegito. Remember how he tore the house down? Well, now he's Super Saiyan Blue and has God Key. So now you're telling me all hell's going to break loose? No, 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 no. Not only do we get the most disappointing fusion sequences in the history of Dragon Ball, but we get Vegito who fails. And what's funny, he is Super Saiyan Blue. Let me just say this. This should not have happened. Writing wise, this destroyed Dragon Ball Super for most of the fandom. Not only should Vegito have had zero problem with Zamas, but the fact Blue failed again just made me shake my head every time the form appeared afterwards, thinking it must actually be giving Goku and Vegeta a minus multiplier or something. Seriously, the whole arc would have been a true success if Vegito just ended Zamas right there with some new technique that can deal with an immortal enemy. It's Vegito, I would have bought that right in, but it would have ended the saga on a high note with the fusion winning once and for all, with blue winning, and with the future still intact, the trunks could just return to. No stupid spirit sword, no stupid Zamasu universe, no stupid button, no stupid Omni King, no stupid erasure, no stupid double trunks, no stupid waste of time ending. The moment they retconned the fusion was the moment they pulled the plug on Super Saiyan Blue once and for all. Goku vs. Hit rematch, look. Everyone is looking good except Super Saiyan Blue. Blue always seems to be the pressurized fool in the fights, whilst the enemy looks badass. No ground gained for Blue here. It just didn't feel dominating at all. We get to the tournament of power preparation, and Super Saiyan Blue just becomes this watered-down form that was meant to be a prestigious ascended Super Saiyan God. It's used against Bagamo, Topo, Gohan, Krillin. Look, it should have never have gotten past Super Saiyan 1 for Krillin. It should have never have gotten past Super Saiyan 3 for Gohan. The writing in these scenes were terrible by degrading Goku's godly might even more in order to justify huge power boosts for other characters. I don't care if he was holding back. The writing should have preserved the blue presence to make it feel more important and iconic when used. Like Super Saiyan early on in Z, it was a big deal back then. Like when Trunks turned Super Saiyan against Frieza, big deal. Imagine he turned Super Saiyan Blue against Freezer instead. Freezer might have actually killed him. In the tournament of power itself, Super Saiyan Blue is used in the most pointless situations where Super Saiyan 1 would have been enough sometimes. 
but the ultimate way to kill a form, just like Super Saiyan God, is just send it towards Jiren. Not only does Jiren make Super Saiyan Blue look like Chaozu up against Cell, but not even the Kaioken Amp was enough, further destroying the dignity behind the original form. Through the tournament, Blue tries to step it up once again, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. Let's talk about Ultra Instinct, the next level that makes Blue as well as God and everything else just lost in the shuffle. Eliminate emotions and move without thinking. But to be honest, that's exactly what the concept of Blue should have been from the get-go, with all of the calm mind principles. The fact it was scrapped and treated just as a power-up made it lose all value. Super Saiyan Blue was suffocated with further upgrades and levels, without even having time to staple itself in history as being truly iconic. Whoever thinks Blue is iconic is living a lie, and they are allowing themselves to be controlled by the corporate merchandise machine. Blue Evolution was another example of making Super Saiyan Blue more irrelevant. Realistically, in the anime, there is no point in Blue ever again. Vegeta seems to be able to hang on to Blue Evolution pretty damn well. If I wrote Super Saiyan Blue, I would have written it to be used less often and actually win the battles it faced through calmness and focus, but showing the struggle to achieve the tranquility as well, as well as being able to feel Goku and Vegeta's hardships and their growth. It should have been Super Saiyan God to Ultra Instinct only, or God to Blue, where Blue was the pinnacle. Too damn much, too damn fast, too damn soon. Let's quickly run over the manga. A good concept in the manga with a blue form was the perfected blue, which gave Goku an insane power-up to fight a fused warrior. Problem is, it didn't get the job done. Therefore, it's not a successful upgrade in my opinion. They did try to preserve Super Saiyan Blue better in the manga with the stamina issue, which I can respect, but the problem was, even when it arrived, it didn't settle anything once and for all. Not like Super Saiyan on Namek, not like Super Saiyan 2 against Cell, not like Super Saiyan 4 against Baby. I prefer the manga to the anime, that's only because it reduces the amount of insults to the forms. But then again, Blue turns up against Moro in the latest arcs, and it's just pointless. Super Dragon Ball Heroes is not even worth my time here today, you know the draw with that show. It's a circus managed by the clowns. There is one big problem and inconsistency with Blue that they never stuck with, which showed the lack of care. It was all about the focus and calm mind, but we often see Goku and Vegeta getting angry and raging in the form, yet the form is still activated. It's a completely stupid decision to make us forget about the properties that made Blue interesting and unique in the first place. If Goku and Vegeta dropped out of the form in their anger, that would be perfect. It would make us see Blue as a more delicate and interesting form, and Blue could have been portrayed to be much stronger than it was by having Goku and Vegeta maintain their focus and calm mind in fights, and making them win that way. I would have liked that concept, but all we got was another level of Super Saiyan, just a passionless power boost, all to try and sell the next toys to make more passionless money. The Broly movie summed this up to a T. Now, I enjoyed the Broly movie, but Super Saiyan Blue is yet again making the sacrifice to make someone else look superior. Broly, a non-god key user, pure Saiyan, treats these god forms like crap. But hey, we do get Gogeta Blue, some epic fight sequence, and a fusion wins the day. Super Saiyan Blue wins the day. Can you believe it? Well, believe it. It happened. And now we ask ourselves, does it even matter anymore? No because it's too late. They had to fuse to beat this non-god key user to begin with. This didn't even redeem Blue because Super Saiyan Blue should have never been needed in this movie from a writing standpoint. Super Gogeta could have been cool enough for the win condition. God Gogeta at a push, that would have been ultimate right and made Gogeta look even more prestigious. But jumping up the forms rapidly, increasing Fusion's power, the forms lost their relevance and impact. This was like the Boo Saga all over again. The game Dragon Ball Fighters tries to make the blue forms look intense and powerful, but it's just a lie. It's the way the game wants you to think about the forms, but we know we're playing a lie. We know how they're really portrayed. I know I've missed something, so be sure to leave a comment on your thoughts and fill the gaps. But in conclusion, I know I haven't said a lot of positive things about Super Saiyan Blue, but the truth is, I tried to like Super Saiyan Blue. And I did at the start. I even thought the design, although pitifully lazy, was still relaxing to look at and broke it up from the warmer looking forms. I put my faith in it, which is something all fans of the franchise should try to do at least once, with any concept, to see how it will work out. But when it all worked out, I didn't like Super Saiyan Blue because of its portrayal and usage. Goku didn't screw Super Saiyan Blue, the writers screwed Super Saiyan Blue. It was portrayed to me as this superficial look to give Dragon Ball Super its image and identity, without a suitable build-up, without an impactful presence, and without ever redeeming itself, all for the money, with no passion or care behind it. It should have been designed as Super Saiyan Green to emphasize the greed for money. Super Saiyan God was the great concept that Super Saiyan Blue murdered. Even Super Saiyan 3 was portrayed better in Z. It wasn't until Dragon Ball Super came along where they decided to throw Super Saiyan 3 under the bus and place its faith in God Key, all for Super Saiyan Blue to blow it all away in a disgrace. Based on its track record, 
Super Saiyan Blue is the form for a loser who had all the hype but choked on the mic. God Key doesn't protect Super Saiyan Blue from being the worst form in Dragon Ball history. You can really sense my enthusiasm here. The God of Destruction Saga. Gohan is living a happy life, as we all should be. But the way he's just disregarded in terms of importance and power is a complete joke. Beerus shows up, and Gohan is nothing. Nothing but a spare part for Goku. Much like the critically acclaimed Dragon Ball GT, where Super and GT does the exact same thing, and that is fuel the awesomeness of Goku. In the Golden Freezer Saga, we see Gohan at his absolute worst. We thought early Buu Saga was bad, but this, at least in the early Buu Saga, Gohan could square off against Abura. But here in the Golden Freezer Saga, in that green tracksuit, I'm pretty sure Gohan was written here to be a laughing stock. It had to be. Why else would Gohan be this shit against henchmen and can barely hold on to Super Saiyan? What an awful time to be a Gohan fan. It felt like someone smacked my cheeseburger out of my hand and it landed all over the floor, like Gohan's body. In a nutshell, this saga showed us how far Gohan had fallen in terms of power by not training. And the writer's not giving a shit. Although he was still successful at home, and as a scholar, in the dangerous world of Dragon Ball, that is not enough to live. And so, even Gohan found it in himself to want to train again and protect the ones he loves. Yes! Finally, we get a Gohan build-up! Another comeback! I'm digging this shit! Exciting! Fast forward to the Universe 6-7 tournament, and Gohan cannot make the tournament. Wow, what a complete crock of bullshit writing, along with a Majin Buu falling asleep joke, just to give Goku and Vegeta some more spotlight in their palette swap in Super Saiyan Blue form. And you know that's the only reason. Oh, and to introduce Kaba. Yay, we get Kaba, the little ship with a tingly back that is astronomically stronger than Super Saiyan 2 Gohan in the Cell games. See what I'm going here? It's insult after insult with the writing and scaling. Wait, Future Trunks is back, giving me nostalgic feelings from the Android Saga. Wow, maybe Gohan will be involved in this because Gohan, Future Trunks, Androids, get it? Let's do it! <laughs> You're kidding, right? Fuck you, fans. Just have Gohan see Trunks off to another future in the absolutely worst, disgraceful end into an arc ever. With no progression to anyone, only setbacks. Well, at least Gohan gets an ice cream. So far, the only highlight of Gohan in Dragon Ball Super is that he's going to play baseball. And we're past halfway by now. So let's go to the big daddy of Dragon Ball Super. The Tournament of Power. 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 Oh, but then some will say, but Gohan made a huge comeback. He challenged Goku and regained his ultimate form. Oh, and that he did. What, did, did you want a medal or something for that opinion that he regained his ultimate form? Hmm? Because... That opinion is about the same worth as Gohan's importance in the Tournament of Power. Want to know where Dragon Ball Super pissed me off more than any other time? And that was this arc with Gohan. Think about it, hear me out. Since the Golden Freezer Saga, there was a tease after tease that Gohan is going to train again and potentially become important once again. You know, just to break up all the screen time from Goku, Vegeta and all this God Key shit. And boom, we get it! Gohan vs the Wolfman. Epic comeback to fight in, showing Gohan's tenacity. Piccolo trains Gohan for a weekend at the campsite, and Gohan gets a power boost beyond any sense in Dragon Ball history just from throwing a few rocks at Piccolo's face. It's incredible, but let's not complain about logic here. We're getting Gohan back, right? That's all that's important. Gohan regaining his ultimate form was some good shit, and seeing him challenge his dad really gave us the impression that Gohan has his warrior instinct and pride here, and could be a serious contender for the top spot in Dragon Ball Super due to his potential that we all know he has. Oh, hell yes. Goku vs. Gohan. I love this fight. It was great. We know Goku is a beast, but it made Gohan look very impressive and deserving. Almost like the writers give a shit. Wait a minute. They do. Gohan is the leader of Universe 7 in the tournament. Oh my god. Gohan is a leader? Just when we thought Akira Toriyama didn't think Gohan was fit to be a lead character. But now Gohan leads the goddamn universe. And here we go. Tournament of power time. And... What the fuck? Seriously? What the fuck? Gohan's the leader? No one gives a shit. Why does no one give a shit? It's, it's not even important. Wait, the team just seems like it's led by Goku and Vegeta anyway. What was the whole point of this massive Gohan build-up? And what was the point in the leader badge? It's all a lie. No! Gohan does a few heroic things in the tournament, but really, this build-up was a complete waste. Because Gohan could have done those things in the tournament without all this investment and build-up time. What a complete fucking waste. Just like they did in the Buu Saga, a complete replica. 
screwing Gohan of any important role. Here's the leader badge, Gohan. Wear it, but it doesn't mean jack shit. You know the writers just made Gohan do a few good moves here and there. And yes, they should. There's enough bloody episodes for one tournament lasting 40 minutes. But you knew deep down it was going to be Goku winning at the end of the day. And Gohan would hold no major importance when it came down to the main part of the show. Dragon Ball GT did the same thing. Gohan is just high tier fodder neutralizer. I don't care what moments they give Gohan in the Tournament of Power because it all led to the same end for him. Being on the bench with his buddy, oh I'm sorry, his father Piccolo, to watch the big boys fight. As usual, ever since the end of the Buu Saga. Look, the Tournament of Power still sits well with a lot of people and for the most part it does sit well with me too, but not as a Gohan fan. The Tournament of Power was the ultimate betrayal and ultimate lie to Gohan and his fans. But in the Dragon Ball Super manga, Gohan goes from this pathetic guy to goddamn Saiyan Terminator in a heartbeat. The guy takes on Kefla, which, let's be honest, for fans who love Dragon Ball when it all comes to power, must be really happy that Gohan got this much of a surge. Out of nowhere. It's almost like the writers don't even know what to do with Gohan. His power is either all or nothing, with literally no sense or good storytelling behind it anymore. Nobody can explain manga Gohan's power in the Tournament of Power, except calling it an ass pull increase through the writer's choice. It doesn't matter how strong he is, what matters is the sense behind it. And the Dragon Ball Super manga had no sense in that department. Look, Master Roshi is fighting Jiren. Did you really see that coming? Come on now, we really didn't. Ultimately, Gohan may have eliminated Kefla, but even in the manga, he was still just a spare part to fuel the real heroes of the Tournament of Power. In conclusion, I just feel ever since Akira Toriyama's decision, to not make Gohan the lead character, it left Gohan's character in limbo, with only his scholarship pathway kind of defining who he is. Because even Vegeta gets a few shots in against Beerus, and if you're a Vegeta fan, great, but if you're a Gohan fan, it's bullshit. But we fans still love Gohan. After all the bullshit he's gone through as a character, after the Cell games, still waiting for the day where Gohan rises up once again, for all of the right reasons, under the correct circumstances, Gohan fans still stick with him. Not just put in the manga he's as strong as Kefla just to shut up the Gohan fans, but actually respecting the character and give him his worth, as well as a meaningful win at the end of a saga that really, really makes a difference, like it did against Cell. Even in the latest manga chapters with the Galactic Patrol, there are still going to be some defending Gohan's appearance in the latest chapters. But really, why? Think about what they're defending. It doesn't matter how good Gohan looks in these fights with all of the sub-bosses, because we know we are not stupid. When the big boys show up, Gohan is getting KO'd or watching from the side. The formula is going to stick because it's Goku and Vegeta's time. This was the kid that smashed up the Cell Juniors after they beat up his friends. The Galactic Patrol is just a lame-ass chapter to throw in a few forgotten characters to give them some false relevance until Goku and Vegeta show up and sort things out themselves. Goku and Vegeta showing up to save the day is so fucking stale and it's the same formula over and over and over. More so since Dragon Ball Super started. I mean, for God's sake, change up the foundation. I'm sick of Goku and Vegeta now as I'm sure most of you guys are. The excitement of Goku died with him at the Cell Games, and Vegeta's died with him against Boo. Ever since those bozos come back, they've been nothing but spotlight hogs. Remember, this is meant to be Akira Toriyama's favourite character, but more like his favourite character to shit on. Piccolo's usefulness in the Battle of God's Ark, getting minced and showing his lack of importance again. In the Golden Freezer Saga, he's relegated to carrying groceries for Videl, babysitting Pan, making funny faces, playing peekaboo. I mean, this is not Piccolo. The only fans who laugh at this stuff are the ones whose favourite character is Vegito, and to them, if you're not a Saiyan, you don't count. You're just fodder. Bullshit. This is not who Piccolo was or should be, or the Piccolo that we know. He deserves so much better than this. But the insults just continue. He defeats a few pathetic henchmen of Freezer, but then continues to show his lack of importance one more time when stronger enemies show up. It's really sad. Oh yeah, didn't he sacrifice himself to protect Gohan again? Ugh, Super really played on our nostalgia for that one, didn't they? What a terrible bit of writing. I can't tell you how excited I was to see Piccolo face up against Frost. I was on the edge of my seat seeing Piccolo in action one more time. It was like HBK returning to fight. But the supposedly smart and wise fighter gets outsmarted by Frost. It's just a joke. Only for the match to be restarted and Piccolo submits to Vegeta to take over. Another classic example of Piccolo bending over for the Saiyans once again. 
Piccolo's only redeeming quality in Dragon Ball Super is that he trained Gohan to make Gohan great once again. And even that's debatable. Look, there's probably a ton more insults to Piccolo in Dragon Ball Super I haven't mentioned, but I just upset myself talking about them. So comment below how else Dragon Ball Super and even Boo Saga of Z ruin Piccolo. Future Trunk Saga, copy Vegeta Saga, are there any really bragging rights for Piccolo? Hell, the Tournament of Power, he got eliminated by an enemy that required a very heightened sense of hearing to find. Something Piccolo is born to do. But that was like the ultimate insult to Piccolo and his fans. A lot of characters became fodder, but Piccolo took the title for it and did not deserve that elimination. And in Dragon Ball GT, despite having a sad death with Gohan present, there was not enough screen time for the Namekian at all. But at least this way, GT did it right for him not to be on the screen, rather than put him on the screen, then demoralize him like Dragon Ball Super did. Overall, Piccolo just now stands at the back of Capsule Corporation birthday parties looking powerful, proud, and super intimidating. But really, he isn't any of that anymore. It's a lie. Piccolo is just there. When we look at Piccolo, I just see a lie. He's just placed it to keep Piccolo fans happy now. He has no time. He doesn't do anything. And that's really, really sad. So much potential. I can't tell you how many times I hear classic Piccolo fans wanting an arc in Super based on Piccolo one more time. Super Namekian gods, all that. But we are not allowed that. Because if you're not a Saiyan or don't have God Key, prepare to die. And to see him get eliminated by some fucking stupid bug made me lose all respect, all respect for Akira Toriyama and his precious canon Dragon Ball Super Catastrophe. This show is an absolute fucking catastrophe how it treats Tien. God of Destruction Saga, Tien is nothing. Golden Freezer Saga, Tien is nothing. Oh wait, he fights a few stupid henchmen, sorry. Universe 6 Tournament, Tien is nothing. Sit on the side, let the Saiyans handle this. Future Trunk Saga, who is Tien? Tournament of Power Saga, oh now here we go. Tien joins the team. Better have some episodes designated to Tien's character to hype him up. Let's give him a dojo. Let's have Goku recruit him, only for him to be absolutely useless in a 2 versus 2. What a complete waste of potentially showing Tien's new abilities or new growth. Everyone else gets a fucking power boost. Wait, he's in the tournament though. Everyone gets some shine in the tournament of power, right? No. Dragon Ball Super does a fantastic job at making Tien look absolutely terrible in all aspects. No use whatsoever. Tons of meaningless scenes that doesn't even make Tien look half of the badass he used to be. Facing off against Fodder. Tien was written to be the fodder of the team. Probably the worst player on the team too. And it's really, really sad. And where the hell is Tien's jacked body gone? He could have ripped Jiren in half with those muscles. Look, I know some would argue Tien did okay in the tournament for who he is. But really, does that sit well with us? We can feel the lies. We can feel like any scene that Tien is in is just put in there to shut Tien fans up. And they really weren't that good. They were just there, almost like force. They had no importance because the big important stuff was saved for the Saiyans. And that's how Tien is treated in Dragon Ball now. He just watches from the sidelines with Piccolo. That's their big game. Poor, poor Tien. What the hell happened? After all this talk, I still don't know. In the Galactic Patrol saga, Tien is recruited and could potentially be a player once again. But really, like I said about Piccolo and Krillin and Yamcha, it's only a matter of time until their usefulness is over and they are just stuck there as filler for when the big boys show up. And it's a repetitive cycle of disrespect. I think the writers need to have the guts and give one of these characters the ball at some point. Or are they too scared to let Goku and Vegeta be at the back for a change? Oh, what destruction in the fandom awaits if Saiyans become mere Saiyans and humans become all-powerful. I can imagine it now, the Saiyan revolution will begin. An Ultra Instinct Super Saiyan times 25 Kaioken King Kai Fist times a million Grade 5 Ascended God Key Infested Mega Ultra Primal Instinct Super Saiyan Goku Base Form will arrive and save the day. But you know who won't care? Tien won't care. Because as a character for years, he's just put up with all of the shit and he's still there, standing tall, taking all the crap on the chin from the writers and the human hating fans. But for us fans who love Tien, I'm so proud we stick together with the humans of Dragon Ball. Characters like Tien have our respect because of their internal growth and acceptance of position. Any real fan wouldn't care about who could blow up a universe just by jerking themselves off. Tien is more than that. Tien is iconic in Dragon Ball, a more relatable character than Goku and Vegeta ever could be. Goddamn role model. Yamcha is just there as barely even comic relief. He's just there. I mean, even with the disrespectful Yamcha death scene being replicated in Dragon Ball Super, 
where even Gohan and Piccolo pointed out as a bad memory. It's just, I can see the joke here, we all do, but this is the type of joke you would see in a fan manga or a meme. To think the writers themselves included this in the show is pretty darn bizarre and makes you wonder, do even the writers lose their focus of characters and cave into the outside world jokes of Yamcha or other things and include them in the main story? Heck, in the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie, Goku even mentions his base form. I mean, is the term base form ever used in previous Dragon Ball? I don't know, just let me know. Shows how much fans have input. But it's quite disrespectful to their own writing to even acknowledge a Yamcha death position that has only ever been made infamous by Dragon Ball fans in the decades of Yamcha smack talk, not through the actual story. It's just another insult to Yamcha to solidify his purpose in Dragon Ball, or lack thereof, and destroying all hope that Yamcha is made into a true hero. And to put the nail in the coffin, he was just written out of the Tournament of Power with an even more belittled storyline. It just seemed like Yamcha would never come back from this. Until now, in January 2020, the newest Dragon Ball Super manga, the world of the Dragon Ball community is bubbling with excitement as Yamcha is back. Sporting the Galactic Patrol logo and ready for war, this guy has destroyed the internet. And why? Because he's fighting? I mean, if Goku or Vegeta battled, it's just another battle, right? But Yamcha, has he really fallen that much to the point where now he's actually fighting, it's actually a big deal? Yes, yes that is true. But then came along one Dragon Ball Super and you can kiss any form of sense and good storytelling goodbye. Because the first thing we see, despite an epic entrance by Goku Black, is our hero Future Trunks. Wait, is this Future Trunks? Why does he look younger than Ash Ketchum? Why the hell is his hair blue? Why is he skinny? This is not Trunks. I swear, the moment I saw this, I thought, no way, this has to be Trunks from another timeline altogether. Not the one he went back and killed Cell in. Not the one who rocked up in the Bojack movie. Dragon Ball Super's future Trunks was a complete and utter disgrace. I would go as far to say he was written to be a bigger disappointment than Kid Trunks, and that's saying something. At least Kid Trunks had no pressure. He was a different Trunks. Born in times of peace, he had no legacy apart from terrible writing of failing to beat Majin Buu. However, Future Trunks, boy did that dude have a legacy, a history, only for it all to be rendered obsolete. Washed away like it never happened. Future Trunks in Dragon Ball Super was like a new character, some innocent little boy from a world that needed help. He showed no qualities of who he was supposed to grow into. He was absolutely pathetic. Oh, but a handful argue. Well, Future Trunks has been through a lot. He's finally broken down. He has PTSD. Give him a break. Look to that guy, first of all. Calm yourself. I'm not having a go at Trunks. This is the writer's fault for being complete jokers. This ruined our memories of Trunks. Ours. Yes, us. We are here as a team. It's us versus the writers. Do you really think the writers give a crap about PTSD and Trunks' is suffering? This is Dragon Ball Super. There is no such thing as in-depth character growth or storytelling. It's as much of a cluster and confusion as a goddamn Rubik's Cube being played by someone who is colorblind. Future Trunks was introduced in Super to try and appeal to new fans, new lovable innocent fans fans, yeah right, who want a new character to attach themselves to. Well congratulations, you got your future trunks. You know something? Newer Dragon Ball fans would have done a lot better with that big jacked up role model future trunks returning. He would have snapped Goku Black's spine in half like he was craving a hyperbolic time Kit Kat. Look, the whole future trunks arc in Dragon Ball Super was introducing us to a new villain in Trunks' timeline. Of course, this was massive fan service bringing Trunks back, but for the love of Kami, Bring him back with consistency, the purple hair, the maturity. I don't give a damn what the reason is for his blue hair. Just keep it consistent, you sloppy writers. There was no problem with it in Z, ever. So with future Trunks arriving in distress looking for help, this could have been a great arc for Trunks to get justice and save his future. But we know where that took us, yes. The stupid Zeno button, the stupid erasure, the stupid ending, the stupid trunks return into a new future where there will be two trunks. I mean, this entire arc was wasted. It was written by a clown. I never even had a problem initially with the spirit sword of hope that Trunks used. Only if that was the finishing move to end the saga. I could have stomached that thinking at least Trunks did it. He friggin did it with the help of the power of the people who were left. But all we got was disappointing moments one after another until the Zamasu universe took place and man, this idea. Whoever wrote that Zamasu universe idea needs to be jackknife powerbombed straight to HFIL.
So we get a meaningless arc, and what does Trunks get? He gets Super Saiyan Rage, or whatever we want to call this. All I have to say is Trunks was portrayed with a Super Saiyan 2 level of power. Sure, he should have been portrayed much stronger after all those years, but the fact this new form, this rage form, which was only added as a cash grab transformation, mind you, to sell the toys. No explanation on any part of it, except now his power goes leaps and bounds over the Super Saiyan Blues of that arc, holding off Goku Black and Zamasu at the same time. You talk about Golden Freeza having an ass pull transformation out of nowhere, but this one comes in second place very closely. It makes no sense, and the writers expect old school Dragon Ball fans to just deal with it like it's okay. This is the type of lazy, thoughtless, cash grabbing concepts which push me away from Dragon Ball Super and any latest installments. I have zero emotional attachments to these characters or forms after decisions like this. And if I did have any, which I kind of did in the beginning with Future Trunks and all the suffering, seeing the death of Bulma. It was all intense stuff, but they just threw it all away as it went on and ruined the finale of the arc, making it all pointless. So why should we care? They need to get better creative workers behind the scenes because I feel that they produce things way too fan service combined with trying to make things appeal for the kids only. They need to stick to a formula, be consistent, and portray characters properly how they should have been. Why do you think Dragon Ball is loved so much to this day? I'll tell you something, Dragon Ball Z was a huge part of it. There was so much potential in the relationship with Mai 2. Everything felt so rushed for anything to really sink in, to let our emotions grow to the characters a little more. We don't see many of the warm moments that build the characters outside of the battles either. Everything is just made light humor of. In the manga, Trunks goes down a different path in becoming an apprentice Kai. We see him tangle with Dabura, which was done quite well actually and I enjoyed that. I only wish that momentum stuck with Trunks, he became pretty much a punching bag for the rest of the chapters to come. So really, an inevitable end for Trunks. Sad really. I really want to know your thoughts on future Trunks in Dragon Ball Super guys. Did you like him or didn't you like his portrayal? What do you think happened to him and could it have been done much better? How would you have written Trunks there in Super because personally, I would have had the arc end with him being the true hero. That button man, it makes me sick. That button identifies how serious we should take Dragon Ball Super. So in a nutshell, what the hell happened to Future Trunks in my own words? His character was butchered in Dragon Ball Super by removing all of the amazing qualities that made Trunks, Trunks. His determination, willpower, growth, memories, becoming his own man. All of that was replaced by a little boy with no hope looking for daddy to help him, which makes future kid Trunks look like a complete badass. Oh, but he had that awesome moment in the backyard where he lured Vegeta to attack him. Wow. You call that great? Really? Really? Super Saiyan Rage doesn't save Trunks' character. The Sword of Light doesn't save Trunks' character. The little pointless empty goodbye that Gohan gave Trunks doesn't save his character. We fans can't save Trunks' character. Dragon Ball Super destroyed an incredible character. And now there is no hope left. For future trunks but just keep buying that merchandise guys it really helps toei akira toriyama and everyone else they love you so much for doing that and they think about you every day goku black or zamasu or zamas or evil goku or if you remember this one evil goten Whichever name you prefer, he was introduced as a main villain in Dragon Ball Super during that series Future Trunks arc. One thing I will say right off the bat, the dark introduction of that arc was spine chilling. The height behind an evil body of Goku was so mysterious it had my attention right away. And with the story set in the future timeline, the same dark timeline as the classics Future Gohan and Future Trunks fought in, making a statement by killing the beloved Future Bulma. The mysterious concept of Goku Black was lined up for success from the get-go, and not to mention sporting a dark Jedi like Gi. And with all that being said, all the hype, all the stars aligned. What the hell happened? Why has Goku Black become a disgrace to the Dragon Ball Villain Club? How did an indestructible concept get obliterated by complete and utter nonsense? Well, you're about to find out the cold, hard truth. Now a lot of fans like Goku Black and you know something? That's cool because I can truly see the appeal there. The dark look, the elegance, the power, the divine personality and the amount of awesome fan art for this guy is on another level. I'm not here today to rip into Goku Black, the concept. I'm here to tear apart the writing decision in the anime and also the manga of how they just did not know how to use a Goku Black in Dragon Ball Super. Just like WCW never knew how to use a Bret Hart, and I love Bret Hart, 
Ah yeah, pink and pink, I see it now. The Goku Black concept was a success. The execution was a failure. And how did the downfall truly happen? Let's take a look how Goku Black started out to be potentially the most serious villain ever, only to finish the saga looking like a complete joke. When we look at the history of Goku lookalikes, the concept of Goku Black had a mountain to climb straight away in terms of originality, but it was successfully pulled off when Goku Black appeared and confronted Future Trunks. That episode took me way back to the times of Dragon Ball Z, the Freezer Saga, the Cell Saga, when it was much darker, and that was the Dragon Ball I became attached to as a kid. As much as I thought Battle of Gods was a decent kickstart to Dragon Ball Super, it seemed the show was heading down a more pleasant, kid-friendly approach. There's pros and cons to that, but it was no longer longer the Dragon Ball I grew up with. However, the introduction in this future Trunks arc reawakened my love and realization why I became emotionally attached to Dragon Ball in the beginning. When this mysterious man appeared with that epic music, the slow revealing of the face, and gave the words to Trunks, at last, today your last day on Earth, saying, Oh my word, did my mind just explode thinking of the possible background of this dude. At first there were tons of rumours of this evil Goten going around, which was just crazy, but many of us already had an inclination that it was Goku. But the crazy thing was, why is Goku doing this? Our minds were spinning thinking, wow, perhaps this is why regular Goku was being built up to be a silly little fool in Dragon Ball Super to emphasise the contrast of a darker version of himself. Has Goku developed a hatred towards his Saiyan race? Or is this really who Goku was before bumping his head? I'm telling you guys, the amount of theories was crazy and I was excited. What was scary at the time was that Trunks was always on the retreat. It was like the androids all over again, but this time, seeing it against a future Trunks who had trained so hard over the years with his new unknown strength, it just made me on the edge of my seat because I realized that no one else was there to help him. The next main chapter with Goku Black was when he arrived to the past and confronted Goku. Wow, even there, the tension was incredible when everyone saw his appearance, and the time rings added a new depth to the story, which I was also interested in. Goku Black always maintained his composure in his base form whilst confronting everyone. This is what kept his presence powerful. And you know something? Seeing him fight against Goku was the perfect good versus evil fight I've wanted to see. The bubbly Goku against the bitter Goku Black. He attacks with no remorse, less chatting, and he was set to be serious business. I felt the battle against Goku was executed well because it showed Black was not even attempting to access higher power in order to deal with Goku's powered up form. This guy could have sailed by himself. And this is where the excitement peaked in regards to Goku Black. As soon as he walked back to the future and started providing dialogue that made me realize, hey, this isn't actually Goku, I started to become more confused than excited. And it was this new background that started adding confusion and just made the entire concept a cluster from here. I always felt the most basic storyline could have been more effective. Goku goes dark side, boom, done. Play that out, and so much depth to be explored in Goku's character that's never showed on a normal day. But no, we find out this is not Goku, this is Zamasu. In Goku's body, yes, an apprentice, with a petty grudge against Goku, who decides to use the friggin' Super Dragon Balls, yes, the Super Dragon Balls. And out of any wish in the universe, he chooses to have he and Goku swap bodies. I mean, the regular Dragon Balls could have done that, but dear me, the Super Dragon Balls? What a way to downplay those. It's like the equivalent wish of Oolong wishing for underwear. This whole arc and character background just became more and more ridiculous as it moved along. Less is more, writers. I really couldn't care if Goku Black was stuck in the future and ready to terrorize a world that is kind of already destroyed anyway. That part has already been told. But this whole character had a chance to maintain my interest when Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks travel to the future to confront him, only for this next execution to be pitiful in my eyes. And then it happens. Super Saiyan Rose. Let me just tell you, Super Saiyan Rose, when we look at it, it's another example of an incredible concept. I mean, yes, it's another palette swap, but it looks cool. So damn cool. Even I will admit that. Goku Black demoralizes the new Super Saiyan Blue power because Super Saiyan Blue it. But the whole Super Saiyan Rose concept seems so amazing on paper and in merchandise sales. Yes, and there it is. This transformation was primarily to sell more toys. It was such a passionless transformation, zero build-up, and literally just stuck on Goku Black to give him a power-up. Oh, but it's rosé. It's different from blue. Wow, is that all it takes to make something appealing to some? Just swap the color and that is it? This form had no meaning behind it to me. You know when we see Vegeta get stabbed? 
This is how I felt at this point of how the writers just threw away the chance to develop some incredible concept and seriously build on it only to stab me right where it hurts and infest Dragon Ball Super with cheap writing and cash grabbing moments where they don't care about an engrossing story. They don't care about character development. They don't care about pacing and they sure as hell don't care about scaling. But this is not the biggest downfall to Goku Black, no no. The biggest downfall is now buddying him up with himself but his actual Zamasu self, only for that decision to take away the main focus from a potentially awesome villain. And now the original concept of Goku Black was just becoming oversaturated with marketing choices rather than character depth. Cleanse the world of mortals, gods are all that matter. Nice script, guys. Did a child write that? Could have used the Super Dragon Balls for that in the first place, dude. The prestigious Goku Black introduction was now destroyed. Super Saiyan Rose would continue to stand its ground thanks to the help of Zamasu, and we can truly see how Zamasu is just making Goku Black look like his pet puppet. Such a backwards decision. Imagine Super Saiyan Rose evil Goku in the future, and it was just him alone, seeking to just kill the fighters of the past, one by one like a Terminator. Man, I could dig that. But this godly plan just overshadowed all of the characters' growth in the saga and totally downplayed all of their potential as individuals. And this whole arc was starting to become underwhelming the more it went along, with ridiculous writing decisions. The Mafuba, Spirit Sword, ugh. Goku Black lost his presence of being a main evil villain all by himself. Someone like Frieza or Cell or Boo, he was just a puppet. We see how Zamasu took Goku's body with a moment of Chi-Chi and Goten being killed, which angers Goku, and we did not get enough of moments like these in Dragon Ball Super. You can truly see the potential of the writing ideas, but poor, poor executions. I mean, we can argue the English version of Goku's Black's voice was pretty cool though, right? But you see all that potential? Yeah, it was wasted. Oh, but he gets his clones and scythes. Ooh, scary. Ooh, look how evil he is. You know what? By this point, I couldn't care. It was just another, here you go, add this to your toy bundle. The kids will love that scythe. Things just appear, and there's no meaning or attachment to it. I mean, when Vegeta sported the final flash against Cell, you knew he trained in the time chain before that. There was build-up and depth there. But a scythe? Come on, man. When we look at previous villains like Cell, they gradually become more difficult as the saga progresses. But Goku Black was the total opposite. In fact, his presence was just becoming more irrelevant until the point he and Zamasu needed to fuse. And right there, this is when Goku Black, the incredible concept, what could have been the greatest original villain in Dragon Ball Super, just faded away into a fusion, proving his inferiority on his own after getting pummeled by Vegeta. Very bad character growth. It's like he just waited around to get beat. Very bad pacing. And all with that terrible saga story of Zamasu's chip on his shoulder. It was so pathetic I had no interest in Zamasu's life or views in the slightest. What a waste. The Vegeta pummeling on Black could have been 10 times better if that was actually an evil Goku who killed Bulma. Can you imagine the feelings behind that fight if it were true? Vegeta fighting Kakarot, but this time the roles are reversed and we feel Vegeta's pain as he smashes that worthless, selfish piece of crap Kakarot to the ground for killing his Bulma. Nah, that would never happen. Goku needs to sell those toys for the kids so we can all be really super excited. I'm not even going to touch on Fuse Zamas in this video, that's another video altogether. The whole Zamas universe thing after the pitiful Sword of Hope ending was just a complete joke and ruined the simplicity which could have been a very good story. It was complete overkill. Black was a victim of poor writing decisions involved in a terrible arc as well as being clustered with crappy character stories such as Zamas. I know Goku Black is Zamas but he could have been someone else and something else entirely. Everything felt so boring and empty I just wanted the arc to end. Oh wait, it did! Goku summons Zeno and erases everything, including Goku Black and that incredible introduction we had of him all that time ago. Remember that? Yes, yeah, screw everything. This is the panic button of the writers realizing they screwed up so much with that arc and just ended it quickly after seeing that stupid Zamasu universe. This saga started out as the Dragon Ball Z I used to love and ended up being the side of Dragon Ball Super I currently despise due to its cheap, thoughtless, cash-grabbing storytelling. In the manga, Goku Black appears a bit more of a brute, emphasizing the Saiyan DNA a little bit more, which I liked. I actually prefer the manga for its approach being a little bit more edgier, but it eventually became the same thing. Zeno, a raise. Oh, would you look at that? Hundreds of Mirzamas. <sighs> 
So yeah, in a nutshell, I liked Goku Black. I still do up until the points the mask turned up and the whole Super Dragon Ball thing, the sudden irrelevance of the time rings, which could have been so much more interesting. The irrelevance of Goku Black that eventually became Murder's Mask, only to have the most abysmal of saga endings. I know many love his design, but we can't lie to ourselves. He was handled poorly, and he could have been so much more. He terrorized an already broken future and killed Bulma, only for us not to care about any of it because of that stupid button. Screw Dragon Ball Super right in. Of course, make sure you tell me your thoughts in detail about what you think of Goku Black, not so much Murder's the Mask or the Ark, but Black himself, his portrayal in video games or any other media. I want to know it all, so comment below. But I have a feeling many of you guys will have felt the same pain and disappointment I did. So much potential in design, moves, and growth. That's how I will remember Goku Black. A grand entrance. A pitiful exit. When it comes to the 10 out of 10 show Dragon Ball Super, what a way to regress a character. Dragon Ball Super ruined Goku in terms of his improvement and skill, even in his own art, making me think did this Goku ever go through all those incredible battles and struggles in Z and the original Dragon Ball? This guy feels like a rookie. They try to emphasize that Goku lowers his guard and is open to attacks, and let's be perfectly honest, this is a joke because Goku was never like this in Dragon Ball Z or the original Dragon Ball. Goku was a goddamn experienced fighter and improved as he went along. But now in Dragon Ball Super, Goku is just outsmarted constantly, made a fool out of in battle, always looking shocked and surprised about what happens in fights. Goku does not learn from his mistakes and doesn't seem to improve, not even as a martial artist, like he's stuck in a void where he's just a blank character with no ability to grow. This is not the Goku I grew up with. There are characters giving him a hard time in skill like Cauliflower, well let's be honest, Goku as a martial arts master should be able to use skill alone to take care of these obstacles. But no, Dragon Ball Super becomes all about power and forgets about the character stories. Goku's skills and experience are constantly being outclassed and he looks incredibly stupid. Every single scene Goku is in, Goku just talks and acts so foolishly and idiotic, to the point where I think, did they press the reset button on him? He was never meant to be super intelligent, but the Goku most of us grew up with was conscious and aware of situations. He was smart but in his own way, as a fighter, and that unorthodox intelligence balanced out his character, and combining that with his kind-hearted nature, Goku is moving along fine. But now in Dragon Ball Super, he's stupid by nature and he's stupid in skill. They really portrayed him that bad that he doesn't even know what a kiss is. Ugh. It's not that he's free-spirited or pure-hearted. He's portrayed as a stupid idiot and there's a massive difference. But then we'll get a few that consistently say, well, Goku was always meant to be portrayed as a certain way originally in the manga and anime. It's only that Goku took a more heroic role when Dragon Ball became westernized. And to me, even if that is the truth, it doesn't stop it from being disappointing. Whichever way you want to watch Dragon Ball Z, it doesn't matter. Goku's character was never damaged or regressed like it did in Dragon Ball Super. And if you believe Dragon Ball Super Goku has good character development, you're living a lie. If I'm perfectly honest, I love how Goku was meant to be this wild, cocky, and selfish guy in obtaining his own goal, with a kind, silly nature to go with it. But what I loved even more was seeing that version of Goku grow into a more mature Goku, being portrayed as a wiser man, a role model, someone to look up to, someone who could make mistakes and show progression by sorting them out, and someone who had a presence that made me feel this guy is experienced. He knows what he's doing. I can't wait to see what he's learned. The way Goku had been portrayed into this hero, especially through the English versions of Dragon Ball, was actually a success in my eyes, and anyone who denies that, that's fine. Those kids can have their stupid idiot stuck in time Goku because he's there in Dragon Ball Super. But the Goku most of us grew up with in the English version of Dragon Ball Z, heck, even the Dragon Ball GT Japanese dub, I'm sure for many of you, that was the Goku who we idolized and loved the most, and was the one who we will remember the most, for appearing like a leader, someone you can rely on. We don't get that in Dragon Ball Super, not in the anime, not in the manga. Now there's nothing wrong with Goku being like he is as a character. It would have been fine for some phase of his life. Goku's character being stuck in time just makes fans grown up lose all connection to him. That's why most older fans gravitate towards Vegeta because he actually grew up in terms of a character and in terms of his responsibilities and motives. Goku became less relatable in Dragon Ball Super. And before Super, Goku was never unintelligent. He always learned incredibly fast, and despite living in the woods at the start of his life, he became accustomed to social life and how the world works. He was uneducated, but was portrayed as intelligent in his own unique way, all up until Dragon Ball Super. You know, Goku in the Saiyan Saga seems smarter, more experienced, more responsible than Dragon Ball Super Goku. In Z, 
Goku would always look at the bigger picture in his decisions despite it coming off initially with no sense, like the idea of getting Gohan to go Super Saiyan 2, or placing his faith in Goten and Trunks to save the world. His efforts were always good spirited. Sometimes he would appear naive, but that was his flaw. That was him being too good hearted. It was good to see Goku have flaws, but actually being obviously made into a stupid idiot in Dragon Ball Super was not the way to give Goku flaws. They totally detached him from everything he once was and it made us feel there was no hope in ever seeing him grow again as a character, except being stamped with the latest sparkly forms to sell toys and make money. He's Dragon Ball Super's poster boy, and a money maker. And they have to keep him neutral, they have to make sure he's the same old frozen in time Goku, because they have to keep making money and appealing to those newer fans, and get their money too. There was one point in Dragon Ball Super where I thought, wow, Goku may have messed up here, and he has to make amends, he has to take responsibilities, and that was the beginning of the Tournament of Power, when it looked like he put everyone in danger for his own selfish desire of fighting. But no, the right thing made it look like Goku did the good thing anyway. Yay, free pass Goku. That was a chance to give Goku's character depth, and to focus on his flaws a little bit more. You know, even after he used the Kaioken times 10 against Hit, and he had the key disorder thing, that was really good. I like seeing Goku in that state, seeing him vulnerable like that. It made it look like he's not an invincible guy with plot armor to save the day. I thought the writers could have really done something with his character to just hit him down a peg, not in a nasty way either. One thing I will quickly mention is Team 4 Star's version of Goku. Look, I really enjoy the Team 4 Star Dragon Ball Z abridged, and I enjoy it as the comedy that it is. And that's what it was meant to be, is a comedy. It's a shame some actually extract the portrayal of those characters in Abridged and bring them over to actual Dragon Ball where they then start believing the actual characters are exactly like they are in Abridged. This is not Team 4 Stars doing, it's some idiotic fans who take it as canon when it's meant to be 100% comedy. Sometimes I think the writers of Dragon Ball Super took inspiration from Dragon Ball Z Abridged Goku. Now the Battle of Gods movie did fine in regards to Goku when he was just coming off the Boo Saga and how he felt angry and achieving the Super Saiyan God power like he did. I felt that was a neat addition to Goku's motivation and morality. He doesn't care about the power, it's the principle behind it and wanted to achieve it for himself. That was great writing for Goku's character and we didn't get enough moments like that and the whole I will not let you destroy my world was brilliant. That's the Goku we love and we hardly ever see good moments like that throughout Dragon Ball Super showcasing what Goku is known for. There's no balance anymore. The powerful motivational moments. Then again, the Battle of Gods movie did have the title Dragon Ball Z on it and not the garbage Dragon Ball Super logo. But we look at Resurrection F and that whole arc in the anime, Whis treats Goku and Vegeta's years of experience like they are goddamn rookies, like they don't know how to fight how to use skills and techniques and mind, body, spirit, Goku in particular, and also friggin' defensive skills. Goku is a goddamn veteran martial artist and has had countless incredible battles over the years. And now the writers in Dragon Ball Super hit the reset button on Goku's experience. What the hell are they doing? He is meant to be the one we look up to in Dragon Ball Super, not the one who should be keeping up with everyone. Goku was moving using his combat instinct as a kid. Do people forget this? Fire whoever is portraying Goku like a complete noob, please. In a nutshell, what the hell happened to Goku's character? He stopped growing internally. And actually, it regressed in Dragon Ball Super just to appeal to the children, to give them someone easygoing to relate to. In fact, Dragon Ball Super Goku doesn't even feel like the same guy he used to be. I don't feel passion or emotion in anything he does anymore. Back in original Dragon Ball and Z and GT, when he faced his enemies, I felt Goku's pain and suffering, how we fought alongside Goku to overcome those obstacles and the tension in the show. It's those moments that stay close to our hearts as fans. I don't care if Goku is modified to be portrayed as this heroic, wiser character in the English dub. I don't care what he should have been because at the end of the day, I liked that Goku. That was the Goku I respected as a character in the original Dragon Ball Z GT for his believable progression. Not like the crap we get now in Dragon Ball Super with an empty shell of a character he was once becoming. The writers and bad fan service screwed Goku. I love Goku growing up and I'll always love the Z Goku. And I'll always see Goku as a hero. Just like the days he arrived on planet Namek looking like a goddamn veteran. And just like the day he sacrificed himself against Cell. Actually, it was at that moment where Goku's character development truly died and never came back. Until GT, but nobody wants to count that as canon, right? Well, tough luck. We'll just have to deal with Super Goku. GT may have reverted Goku's body back to a child, but Dragon Ball Super reverted everything else of Goku back to a child. Goodbye, role model Goku. Until we meet again. In conclusion, to put it into one sentence, 
Dragon Ball Super did not have any passion. It was so corporately driven to appease that it made me sick. When I close my eyes and think back on Dragon Ball as a whole, I remember times like Goku turning Super Saiyan, or before that, Goku stepping up to face Piccolo, Goku and Krillin training together to get through tough times, and Gohan snapping to save his friends, and Vegeta becoming a new man by sacrificing himself for his loved ones. When I close my eyes, I see Goku leaving with Shenron at the end of GT, I see Pan crying and the Golden Great Ape coming to his senses and forming the ultimate Super Saiyan. When I close my eyes, I see those moments that inspire, motivate and drives me in real life through my training, through my work, and through struggles in general, as I'm sure it does to many of you guys. When I close my eyes, I do not see anything in Dragon Ball Super because everything in that series had no soul and felt shoved down our throats in a corporate way to sell toys and make money. I can't relate to the lack of emotion in it. I can't relate to how empty consequence and pain are made to be. To me, Dragon Ball Super is completely superficial and a parody of what Dragon Ball used to be years ago. It's modernized and made safe to watch. And through that, had lost what truly made it great. And you know something? I really wanted Dragon Ball Super to be that show to succeed. I wanted to experience new moments with the same passion and emotion as before, but in different settings with characters I grew up with, maybe even new characters, but it didn't happen. And you know, Dragon Ball Super isn't to blame. It's the writers, the corporations. Don't blame Dragon Ball Super, guys. That show is the victim. Victim of corporate assholes. So overall, is Dragon Ball Super a good series? No, it's not. But do some people like Dragon Ball Super? Yes. And you know something? That's okay because you can like what you want. But for the love of Kami, admit it's bad. It's okay to like bad stuff, but admitting it's the golden egg, even superior to GT, is a complete lie. The secret to understanding Dragon Ball Super is to wake up from the hype train and take off the Super Saiyan Rose tinted glasses and actually have the courage to admit that you have wasted precious time defending it for all the wrong reasons. That's primarily the problem. Most Super Only fans get very angry and defensive about the product because they've spent so long investing in it and defending the concepts in it that they don't want to feel like this whole five years plus has been a waste of their life. It's sad, but sometimes you need to wake up or you'll keep living in denial. And denial is something that consumes some Dragon Ball Super fans. If Dragon Ball Super had a soul, had passion and love in the writing, caring for the characters and telling their stories like it should be done, I would have had more respect for it. And that is what I consider to be the most important thing Super was missing, that would have made it a masterpiece like the originals, having good storytelling, consequence, better pacing. It's way too modernized, but like I said, it's okay if you like it, and I won't laugh at you for liking it. That's not who I am. I've been laughed at for years for liking GT, and I've dealt with it because I knew the truth at the end of the day. It didn't bother me. It's funny because GT is actually a lot better than people made it out to be. But now, after a few years, we can clearly see it's Dragon Ball Super that needs its ears scrubbed. Like I said, it has something to like for anybody. I love Ultra Instinct, so I love that part about Super and the concept behind it. But even though the entire series is Goku's journey about obtaining Ultra Instinct, that end product still didn't justify the journey, and Ultra Instinct cannot save Dragon Ball Super for its inevitable decline in the future of Dragon Ball. I guarantee, in 10 years' time, fans will look back on Dragon Ball as a whole and remember Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z as the best parts. But when it comes to the anime of Dragon Ball Super, it will not stand the test of time. And slowly in time, GT will be more recognized as the superior sequel and continuity to Dragon Ball Z. Why might you ask? It's non-canon. It has nothing to do with canon. The reason why is because that movement has already begun. Maybe someday, Dragon Ball Super will come back and rectify the first wave by implementing everything I talked about before. Maybe the anime version of the Moroark will finally get it right, and maybe one day I'll come back and say, finally, it's gotten better. But I'll never come back and say, I was wrong about this video, because right now, what's happened has happened, and it will never be erased. Not even Zeno can erase the disgrace that is Dragon Ball Super. And it's the creators and writers to blame. The ones who orchestrated its production, let it go through, and led fans to believe it's good when it's actually not. Why are we settling for this garbage? We are loyal Dragon Ball fans who invest a lot of time and love into the product as a whole. We pay those corporate ass clowns our money, our time, 
to keep them in business. Without us, without our support, Akira Toriyama, Dragon Ball is nothing. Remember that. And we, we as a fandom, should stay united together because we deserve so much better than this utter cash grab of a series. But I'm sure I've not mentioned something about Dragon Ball Super in this video, and for that, I apologize. This has been a monster to make, but sometimes you have to become a beast yourself to tackle the monster. And whilst in this beast mode, I've probably forgotten something in my onslaught. So tell me below something that you did not like about Dragon Ball Super. Do you agree or disagree with my points? And heck, because I've been such a saint today, tell me something you like about it if you want to. But I'm guessing because you've made it this far into the video, you'll probably never look at Super the same way again. It may be sad, but it's the truth. And it's not like I wanted to change your view on it forcefully. I laid the foundation down for you guys to make your own decision, and I'm proud of you if you now see the truth about it. Continue liking Dragon Ball Super if you want, but never forget that it's a soulless, passionless cash grab looking for your money. And if that sort of product appeals to you, then by all means, continue wasting your money and time. If this video sat well with you, I'm glad I could be of assistance in providing this honest information to you, as harsh as it was. But if you are there, crying on your bed now, staring at your Super Saiyan Blue Vegito poster, ready to write an insulting message, when I haven't been angry or abusive to you in any way, then all I can say is deal with it. Just like us Dragon Ball fans had to deal with the goddamn disgrace that is Dragon Ball Super. But always remember, it's not Dragon Ball Super's fault, it's the writer's fault. Thank you for watching, scholars. And I'll see you in the next dimension.